The scientific revolution starts now. Anastasia, uh, I believe, um, was taunting you on Twitter or something <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> over the hard question of consciousness, which is something... I think I was mostly taunting all of Twitter because something that I've really struggled with is that I haven't been able to find someone who can satisfactorily explain the hard problem of consciousness to me. And every time somebody explains it, I'm like, that doesn't seem like a problem. Yes, so the unusual uh, way in which you're looking at it is not so much that you have difficulty understanding the hard problem, but you have difficulty to understand why others think the problem is hard. Yeah, exactly. Right? I think I might help with that. Ex that's despite, what I was hoping for. that being for. the unusual perspective. <laughs> and so it's funny because that's what I said on Twitter. I'm like, can somebody please explain to me why this problem is hard? And somebody was like, you need to talk to Yosha. And I was like, I emailed Yosha a while ago, but we were uh, we started this show as puppets. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So we, we were we built these giant aliens, and we mm -hmm. would puppet the interviews because we wanted. We we decided that uh, the ideas that we wanted to explore scientifically were so far out because the goal of the show is to explore the theories that will overturn current paradigms in mm -hmm. geology, cosmology, biology, physics, whatever. And so we always find people that have these kind of weird ideas. And we were like, okay, this will be more acceptable if it's not humans doing the conversation, but it's aliens. Mm -hmm. Because then there's this fictional frame that people can be comfortable in. And after I think we were, uh, to be honest, I think we were a little scared of putting ourselves, our faces, and our, just being people on the internet. We really wanted, we were scared of that initially, but we, we got over it. One of, our, <laughs> one of our mentors was like, you have to stop this. He actually came on the show and he talked to the puppets for like three hours. Not longer. We recorded a bunch of episodes with him. And then at the end, he was like, what you're doing is great. You can't keep doing it this way. And after that, we got rid of the puppets. They're in a box in a closet. And so here we are. <laughs> and so I think I emailed you when we were still the alien puppets. And that's a really hard sell for people because you have to be like, hey, would you come on the show and be, em be interviewed by aliens that are puppets? And everyone was like, no. Well, I think we are anthropomorphizing people too much. So I'm in principle, open to trying different presentations. Sometimes the puppet is limited because you can express less. I, I think the idea of making something that is not human, but more expressive than a human being, that would be potentially quite interesting as an experiment. I think that's what really killed it is we couldn't make eye contact and we couldn't... It, having a conversation is so much more than the words that are happening, right? Mm -hmm. That's why it's often difficult to talk to people on the telephone about very serious or important matters because you can't see them and and gauge their reaction. Of course, you could puppetify the interview after the fact. That's true. That... That'd be a lot of work, though. <laughs> <laughs> so we try to put out two of these a week. You'll probably notice us, by the way, we do like camera changes during the show. So mm -hmm. don't don't be alarmed. We're just we don't want to edit later, so we try to get it all while we're recording. One thing that might be good is if I can do a very, very brief phone call at 11.30. Okay. And Absolutely. then I have time uh, probably way into the afternoon. Okay. Fantastic. So basically we have open-ended. If we that's do incredible. this two hours, three hours, that's fine. Do you want to just start after the phone call? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do that. We can spend the last uh, next 10 minutes just chatting about... Uh, uh, well, it seemed to me that you have career questions that you are pondering. Is this correct? I'm interested in the way that people shape their lives when they have more freedom than the average person. Because I think that most people show up and they work at a place and they stay there and they advance on the basis of necessity and availability. And then there's other people who stop and they look around and they really plan what it is that they want. Yes. And so you the question like is mostly life. how to get uh, rid of your fear. And that seems to be the hard thing. I recently watched a presentation by Sam Altman where he uh, told uh, the story that he often watches people who decide to start a company first so they become free and then can do the thing that they want. And his perspective, that never works. Hmm. Basically, people always get stuck doing their company. 
and um, not achieving the thing that they actually wanted to do. And so to him, that's not a very good strategy. Then again, I, I think that his perspective is also a little bit unfair because not starting a company and just doing the thing that you want also doesn't work. And so it's um, it's tricky. It's an alignment but, issue, huh? Yeah, uh, but I find when I want to talk to my former self, I would mostly want to tell my former self that I shouldn't worry so much. Like, you'll never be rich, but there will always be enough uh, money to uh, keep you and your family uh, afloat. Just do the thing that you want to do and do it well. Because um, if the thing that you want to do is uh, sufficiently important and there are too few people doing it, um, you will be able to do it. And so with hindsight, I would say um, I should be a lot more calmer because despite my teeth being very rare, uh, they they have a reason for the things that I'm doing and for the stuff that I'm interested in. And institutions have reasons for not funding this and uh, um, structural reasons, but not good reasons. That's, That's a huge part of what we processed before starting this project, where it was possible to continue down the line and to stay in the academic world, but it was always going to be tangential to the things that we wanted. Mm -hmm. And it's hard in the density of media that there is in the world right now to start a project like this because there's there's 30 million podcasts. Mm -hmm. And so most of them have two or three episodes, but still that's, that's a reflection of just how saturated the space is. And it took us not that long to figure out that we were putting something into the world that people really wanted. And so it's allowed us to continue, but it's also. Well, one thing, one thing that's been really shocking to me is that you don't need a huge audience, but you do need an audience that's really good and really supportive and really, really interested Mm -hmm. in what you're doing because we've been able to basically support ourselves with a pretty modest audience at this point because we have our proportion of patrons to audience is kind of unheard of. Like the people who listen to our show really care about these topics a lot, but there's just not that many people that we've found so far. I mean, we've only been doing this for a year and a half. There's just a small audience for these niche ideas. It seems like too. So it's, it's, that was kind of shocking to me. That's not quite true. I, I found that the Lex Friedman podcast, in some sense, are serving a similar audience. And uh, Lex arguably is not even that good. He uh, prepares himself well and so on, and he tries to be serious about what he does, and he treats the people that he gets on the show very well. But uh, I think his main appeal is uh, the speakers that he gets on the show. Mm-hmm. He's he, really well mm-hmm. connected, right? He's yeah. buddies with Joe Rogan, and he had an enormous platform right out of the gate. Yeah, I mean, he, I think, started out with playing his MIT card relatively well and then um, turning this into a brand that he carefully curated. And he gets millions of views for mm-hmm. single shows, which for uh, a science tech podcast is, is really a lot. Yeah, it's incredible. And if you see the things that really fly, uh, you notice that, of course, if you want to do audience maximizing, you have to do something completely different. I've I've noticed that there's a lot of podcasts that get trapped by uh, an audience that can be readily mined. Like I don't know if you've noticed that there's some big pod big ish podcasts, not Lex Friedman size, that are really into UFOs, mm-hmm. that are really into kind uh, crystal healing. There's all these. Well, different... they start off as interested in sci- all sorts of sciences, and then they find out that they get the most views from say UFO videos or ancient alien. Or like ancient I don't know. aliens is a really good one. Right? Yeah. These these sort of fantastical niches and that's all they end up doing for the rest of their career and it's I think it's a little bit depressing for them in the end because they're forced into something that they didn't really set out to do so we're trying really hard to avoid that they are starting out as telemarketers who are trying to get an audience (laughs) that's true right and the alternative is doing thirst traps what's that oh just thirst I think Anastasia can explain it to you at some point (laughs) she's our twitter (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, what, one of the things that I love so much about Shiloh is that he lives partially dissociated from the pop cultural landscape. And so sometimes people will say things and Shiloh would be like, what is that? I've never heard of that. And I'm like, that's, I, I love that. 
Mm -hmm. And so a thirst trap is, I've never had to define it before, but it's a thing that somebody posts in order to induce coveting in someone else. Mm. Usually, mm. usually a lascivious coveting. Mm -hmm. But I in just, the context of science podcasts, well, there's some like in every context. You uh, cleavage always seems to work. Uh, is, uh, basically, the, the demand for good cleavage is much higher than the demand for good philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> and in some sense, that has integrity. I guess it's uh, it's not my market, but uh, basically, I, I see it. I'm not sure if I'm envious. I think I would be envious if I were doing my own podcast because it's so unfair. It is really a, a <laughs> tricky scene because you want to remain full of integrity for the, the way that you see the world and how you approach it. But then you go into looking at the algorithm and looking at what succeeds and looking at what explodes. And you realize that you have to pander to people's most basic desires in the most obvious way possible. Like there's a video. I feel like the Minoans fig ladies figured this out. <laughs> yeah. You know, have you seen these? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so. It's a good, good filter, though. I've been invited on podcast by 22-year-olds who play that game. And I said, sorry, I, I cannot be on a podcast with you. This is, is not working. I mean, in an ideal world, the, she would be both hot as hell and brilliant. But I feel like those are normally... Like, by the time that you have to gimmick to cleavage, I'm not sure that you have the top-shelf questions. I think there's a difference between uh, beauty and grace on one hand and hotness on the other, because mm. hotness is an advertisement of something that you do not plan to deliver. Mm. Right? It's a manipulative game, and that is, uh, in some sense, distorting the playing field. I love that. That's very well put. Yeah, that's exactly right. How did you come to have this definition? Oh, it's just uh, observing. <laughs> I noticed that uh, some of the people, uh, uh, that some of the women I liked most were not hot. And I tried to put my finger on what actually defines hotness. Right, And it's uh, you don't actually need even to be beautiful to be hot. That's right. Because it is an offer that is being made. Despite this offer not being something that is actually fungible, because it wouldn't be sustainable. Mm. That's interesting. That's put, it. It puts a real negative spin on hotness, which is interesting, because it's in some sense that unwillingness to deliver almost necessitates resentment in the viewer. It might be, uh, but uh, if you understand that this is a game and you are, it's okay in your culture to play that game, right? It just creates another dimension, but it's a dimension that, for instance, would definitely distract from doing a philosophy podcast. And so some communities <laughs> have strong norms against it. For instance, uh, when I was in Boston, most of my friends were uh, Eastern European Jews outside of MIT and Harvard. They just got out adopted by a bunch of people who dragged me to Burning Man and into their circles of friends. And I felt very much at home there. And at some point, uh, a girl who was not part of this community told me that she felt that the women there hated her and uh, were uh, really bad to her and so on. And then I realized uh, none of these women in this community were putting on makeup. And uh, they were basically, there was a tacit agreement to not play certain games because it would distort the interactions between people. There are contexts in which you are going out for a dance or in which you are flirting or mating or whatever, but in normal everyday context, you don't do that. And it, this is where I became very conscious of it. Because it's also something that uh, is taboo among the women that I lived with. The, co the contextualization of your presentation is something that I stress out a about a lot, actually. We literally were stressing out about this yesterday, or the day before. Yeah, because, well, I, I had to figure it out when I started lecturing at the university, because normally I just wear shorts and a t-shirt, you know. We live in the country, I'm gardening all the time. It's just, I'm pretty casual. but. There's something about making people comfortable in a context. I guess if everybody else is wearing makeup at a dance, then it would make sense. It's something about, you know, at least putting on a blazer or something that makes the audience more comfortable if your audience is in a professional context. Mm -hmm. And it's, I don't know, it's weird to walk that line because at some point you can just be putting on something that you're not if you go too far with it. But at the other hand, you're trying to make everybody comfortable. It's tricky. There's authenticity is for sale when you're on the internet. And the social mores of what makes 
for an authentic experience inside of you and between you and your audience, I think is along the same line of the, you have a group of people and there's a set of rules and everybody conforms to those rules. And that feels authentic because the rules have been set at the lowest possible level of like, okay, we're not going to interrupt this interaction on the basis of how we paint ourselves. And so when you come into the position that Shiloh and I are in, where we're like on television, right? It's not really mm -hmm. television, but it's still that principle. Oh, it's there's, uh, television for young people. Right? There's also television for old people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so there is this constant question of, okay, well, who are you? What do you show? How do these decisions make people feel as you show them? Mm -hmm. And how close to you are those decisions when the camera's off? And how good of a job do you have to do in bringing those things together so that in an intellectual conversation with somebody over Zoom, you're the same person that you are when you're later washing dishes or dealing with the fact that, you know, the cat puked everywhere? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the most important thing is sincerity. Once you fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I just terrifying. find it to be the hardest thing in the world. I, I mean, I hope I don't fail at it too often, but I, I find it to be the hardest thing in the world to just be yourself in a public space where everybody's staring at you and just really work on yourself to the point that you're comfortable with yourself and you don't have to pretend to be somebody else or just become more autistic like me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sometimes wish that I could. I wish there was a switch. I grew up in a really close-knit family. So mm -hmm. I was born in Russia. We moved to Israel. We moved to Canada. We moved to the United States. And when we came to the United States, there was just five of us in the entire hemisphere. Mm -hmm. No family here, no friends. It was just this little nucleus. Mm -hmm. And so my family was very, very tightly knit to the degree that, you know, most of my parents' friends let their kids lose their Russian. We spoke mm -hmm. Russian at home. Mm -hmm. We still speak it. We text in Russian. I haven't lived in Russia in 33 years. Mm -hmm. My brother was not born in Russia. He was born in Canada. He speaks, reads, and writes Russian. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, was only possible because of the way that the family was interwoven. And so I've grown up with this just con constant monitoring of people's states, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you have this very tight-knit family and everybody's like emotionally intertwined, mm -hmm. You have to be aware of everything that's happening. And sometimes I wish that I could just turn it off. I wish that I could just go out into the world and be like, I don't care. I don't oh, care. That I makes total sense. But uh, I don't think that being an American is an option. <laughs> and why would you give up your soul? Uh, these are savages. They are socialized with three generations of Disney. There's, uh, <laughs> there's no culture. That's me. Yeah, that's where I grew up right in the heart of America, in the suburbs, in Ohio. There's just yeah, I was raised on Hollywood. Market. America's Shiloh would always tell me that he he grew up in Columbus, Ohio, and that Columbus. What was the thing that you would tell me? It's like the restaurant test market of the world, and for all the brands, like they try out all the clothes and foods on the Ohio people because they're the most middle of the road people in all of America, essentially. So yeah, raised on Hollywood. Learned. Uh, <laughs> we went to church, but you know, it was very. It was a very empty culture, for sure. It was difficult to find my way out of that. But being at unease with the world is, in some sense, what brings most of the interesting people together. This thing uh, that you feel profoundly not at home in the world that you're in, that you dislike the aesthetics of the world around you. And this creates a tension that allows you to become conscious of uh, who you are, because it requires that you reflect your own identity in some sense and construct it as something that works for you. Yeah, but you don't have any role models. Is the, that was the most difficult thing for me growing up. Yeah, but I, people imitating yeah. role models are the worst. Come on. Mm, interesting. God, I had a hard... Like, I tried to find... Uh, you know, I'm, I had a career in music and I was very much interested in poetry and art and... I tried to look up to a lot of my favorite artists, but I always found that they were flawed human beings. And it was really difficult for me to learn that there are no real idols for you. There's nobody to model yourself yeah. on. And it was just really hard for me for some yeah. reason. It took me most of my 20s to get through that. When I was in Berlin, we put up pictures in our apartment of um, Boris Vian and uh, 
Brentano and uh, Milan Chomsky. And uh, basically, I, I, later, the living ones I got to know when I came to the US, like Minsky and Chomsky. And I realized how human they were and how flawed as human mm -hmm. beings. And it was an important insight for me to see that uh, what makes people great is usually some defect in their psyche because the incentives for being great are, are actually not great. And so true greatness typically emerges over some disturbance in your crystal structure. My take on Chomsky is that he is somebody who failed very hard as a child due to being a nerd. And mm. he happens to be one of the best writers of his generation. When he sings, he thinks in, uh, puts out, out stuff not in paragraphs like me, but in entire chapters, complete with reference. You ask him something, he gives you a book chapter every time. But it's not designed to be um, true. It's designed to win the debate. Mm -hmm. And he's an extremely skilled debater who has uh, won a lot of debates in which he was wrong. Mm -hmm. And he's smart enough to realize this. And uh, I think he should be smart enough to understand the damage that he had been wreaking, for instance, in linguistics due to insisting on being right in situations where he didn't have an answer. And where he was basically stomping out um, tiny grasses that could have grown into something interesting. And a similar thing happened to Minsky. So uh, I think that sometimes uh, the greatest people are also the ones who are creating peril if they are surrounded by people who are less great than them and cannot transcend them. Most people oh, don't so take, take greatness as a stepping stone. Right? So if you don't feel threatened by greatness, it's good. But most people really feel uh, are in this midwit range where they can copy theories uh, and propagate theories but cannot make up their own. And um, not disprove existing theories. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this conversation. It's a really good one. We are entirely supported by our patrons, which you can go and check out the landscape of at patreon.com slash demystify sci. We don't have ads. We don't have sponsors. Nobody tells us what to do and we'd like to keep it that way. And you need to help us make that happen by supporting the program, which gives us time to interview more people, to reach out, to explore the landscape, and to make this a better and better investigational tool. If you don't have the money to become a patron right now, please just share the podcast with somebody, leave a comment. All of these things help us improve the quality of this project biggest hurdle in my own life just even in a marriage or anything being able to win an argument doesn't necessarily help you and when I go and I talk about people with my own theoretical ideas recognizing that oh I could just win this argument really quickly isn't gonna get me into developing my ideas more and I always have to force myself to remember that there are things I might not know and maybe this person has access to them, even if they're not presenting them in the best way possible. And my goal is to keep that conversation going so that I can stir up new developments in my own ideas, not necessarily just to win the argument. And it's such a hard thing to beat your ego down over and move on with. I had this in earlier relationships, but not in my present one, which has been going on for 26 years. And... I find it has to do a lot with the attitude that you have to each other. When you feel that you're basically two thoughts in the same mind, then um, you also don't try to convince yourself of something that may or may not be true. And there's usually fear involved that the other one is going to create a reality that is untrue. And uh, if there's a mutual understanding that uh, both of you are going for the same aesthetic, that the end goal that you are going for is the same, and you're just looking at different parts of the world, then there is a very big interest in listening to the objections of the other because they all allow you to see more depth in, in the things that are happening. And sometimes you get scared, right? You get stressed out and you're not able to think clearly. And then there's the question, how can you get back to the space where you trust each other? And when you, you don't have the same goal and the same aesthetics, you need a new relationship anyway. Have you considered going to marriage counseling as a third option? I'm not sure that I can solve most people's problems. <laughs> and basically, I'm, I'm too um, idiosyncratic. I'm too rare. There's, uh, I can help some people with some of their problems if they have similar problems as the ones that I'm somewhat familiar with. But I also cannot solve most of my own problems. So I'm not somebody who is a spiritual teacher. I did notice that marriage counselors are not being stopped by this. So when my wife and me had a deep, severe two-year relationship crisis, we went to a number of counselors who all basically told us uh, that to abandon all hope. 
But all of them were singles. None of them had a working relationship. Oh. Mm. It's kind of like going to the doctor that's really unhealthy looking, and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to take nutritional advice from you. Yeah. yeah. And but I also had an idea about relationships that I thought was unsustainable. This, uh, there is a notion that you're only entitled to a relationship if you don't actually need one. Right? First of all, put yourself into a state where you don't need a relationship, then you can have one. Because there's this big danger of codependency that is looming over your head. But there's another perspective, which is that we are intrinsically incomplete the way in which we are born. And in order to become complete, we need to find somebody who is holding up some other part of the fort. Right? And th that also makes it so difficult once you have this bond to give it up if it's not really working, because it's going to break away an important part of your functionality that is difficult to recover. I mean, Shiloh and I have been together for 10 years at this point, and it is, we're so intertwined. And obviously it's like there's conflicts and there's things that you have to get through because that's life. Like that's, there's there's no there's no opportunity w to have somebody who's a perfect person, right? And so they're always going to fail you in some number of ways. I fail, he fails, everybody fails. And there is this tendency in the world to be like, well, failure is unacceptable and the relationship must end with some really low baseline of failure where people behave like it's better to walk away from something than it is to stay and to work through it and to get dirty and to be vulnerable. And I think that it can be really scary because, like you said, if you have a two-year rough patch in a relationship, that's a really, really long time. But at the same point, over the course of a life, is it really that long? I think it was the price that we had to pay. That um, Basically, it was her first relationship. She was 19. And I was wary of this because I thought she's going to change a lot in the next few years. And uh, I'm going to change somewhat. And... I was 23, but I'd been in relationships for seven years at that point. And so I thought I've been through a lot of things and had made many of the transformations. But how is this going to fit once she is a full adult? Right? Is she, does she still fit into this relationship or is she able to find a new fit? And this is essentially what got us. And so this realignment of uh, accommodating a new person or a new pairing in a relationship that was very difficult for us to achieve. And there was really this big fear, do I still fit in? Or am I, do I have to cut up an important part of myself if I stay in this relationship? And there's also the other question, if you're a stage designer and you realize it's 14 hour days and it's not really compatible with having kids, do you choose kids and family or do you choose the career that you've been working for all your life? That was also an important aspect. <sighs> yeah, that's a, that's right on the front of our table right now as well it's it's a very difficult road to navigate what did yeah. you end up determining there well we went for the kids and family and for stage design i think it is very hard to pull this off because uh, the way it works in germany is that you have to be an assistant for many many years and very few of the people who go to that route uh, manage to become uh, fully employed as a stage designer and so in Mira's class at uh, Kunsthochschule Weißensee, which is one of the most prestigious places to study stage design for theater in Germany, she was the best one. And almost all of her class dropped out at some point out, out of this career class. And the two women who managed to get in did this by having relationships to, this, uh, to other stage designers uh. and, uh, or to a director. And it, uh, so it didn't work like you have a family and on the side you have a career in the theater. So that was pretty tough. And on the other hand, uh, she felt, which what she was surprised about and me, that when we had children and I said, you're spending so much time with them, maybe find some solution to get a nanny or whatever and you do whatever you want. No, I want to spend that time with the children. I don't want to miss out on it. It's the most important time in my life. And right, she did not experience this at a loss. There was some Thing, but she felt I would wish there was a place for me to work professionally and to develop myself professionally. But it was also um, given the choice. She chose the children also later on. We had a philosopher on the show in the early days. I believe it was L.A. Paul who mm -hmm. was talking about transformative experiences and how you just don't have the information necessary to make that choice. You don't know what 
your life, your new life is going to look like until it happens. And I imagine children are the perfect example of that. Because you're not the same person you're not the same person after you've gone through the experience. And so you can't forecast onto the agent that you will be on the other side of it because you have no idea what the priorities of that agent will be. And so you're always rolling the dice in the sense of, is it worth trying to become someone else knowing that I will lose who I am today? And I think that that's for women and children and child rearing. That's often the case because I watched my sister go through this. She just had kids. She's 40. And one of the, th she was a professional. She, she worked at Google for like 10 years. Um, and then she decided that, okay, it was time to have kids, but she was terrified that she would become someone for whom children were the center mm -hmm. and she would lose all these other parts of herself. And now that she has a child, I think that she recognizes that it's just, this is better than anything that you can get out of a career. Yes. I think is that you basically feel that what you did before you had children was jumping up and down and looking at things. And this stuff is not lost. It's there. It's a part of who you are still, but you have additional layers that uh, down-regulate this part when there's more important things. And taking care of the next generation is suddenly the most important thing because you identify as a multi-generational being mm. that is reaching from the first cell into the future. And we, it's up to you right now if it ends here or if it continues and how. So it's I, quite profound. And I found that uh, I was worried that she would digest her brain and become boring or anything or complacent. And the opposite happened. She developed so much depth. And I never felt lonely in this relationship. I'm very grateful for this. She didn't stop reading. She read a lot more. She uh, developed much more in terms of psychology and self-awareness and people awareness and Uh, social thinking and also philosophy and it's quite profound and she became a much more well-adjusted human being during the pregnancy because everything basically got adjusted and fell into place i think about that line of living beings from the very first cell all the way to us and i also think about it in terms of the spiritual wheel of life I, i think this is kind of like a vedic cosmology a little bit where mm -hmm. you continuously are reincarnated until you get to a point where you reach nirvana and you don't and yeah. i i have this tendency of looking at life as this continuous process that actually reaches back before the first cell like mm -hmm. I, i was listening to your lex friedman podcast and i was surprised that you identified life with cells but I, I see it as this iterative process where I wonder if there is some kind of spiritual event that happens when you reach the point of reproduction and you decide against it, mm -hmm. where it's a release of the burden because being human is really difficult. It's, mm -hmm. it's painful. It is. The poet William Blake addressed this head on and he treated it as the sin of generation And he, he tells the stories, he retells these ancient biblical narratives as if having children is actually getting in the way of spiritual enlightenment to some extent. Like Not you're denying having children is spiritual suicide. Can you elaborate? We have no longer stake in the future of life. I guess It's only narrative now. You have ideas about how you contribute to the future, but you're actually no longer part of it. I guess, a, I guess an artist is the one rare piece of society that is transforming future generations without generating more beings. And I Imagine assume that, that Blake you, uh, Your put value himself. as an artist is uh, given by how much the audience appreciates you is broken to me. But maybe this is idiosyncratic to the type of artist family in which I grew up. This idea that I have to adapt basically to the impact that I have to the on, on my environment is, um, is distorting my ability to do art. So as an artist, I am in some sense completely fine with having an audience of one or of zero if the art that I'm doing is good. It's, it could be that, uh, that, that what you're doing is reaching a large audience or a small audience, but in some sense that's incidental. Okay, I agree with that. But the other part is that There's plenty of people whose work becomes influential after death. Mm -hmm. 
right? So it's not that you're playing to an audience and you're you're performing this iterative loop of how will I make the tastiest Frito that somebody will buy, but instead it's that you say something about the human condition that is so powerful that it persists in the world after you die. And the question is, if you're an artist, is would I lose my ability to say those things if I had children and that was where my focus was? Of course. I mean, uh, this form of uh, the sacrifice has integrity to say, I don't want to have children because art is more important to me. It's, there's nothing wrong with this. There's also this possibility that only very few generations are left or we really don't give a shit about the future generations anymore because millennials suck and Zoomers are the worst and uh, it doesn't get better after that. <laughs> I feel like every generation has said that about the previous generation. It did, right? Uh, it did. And yet... <laughs> And here we are. <laughs> that means we're getting old. <laughs> no, but look at them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was looking at the commercials for uh, the new Apple Vision Pro, and I look at these uh, shit faces, and there is nothing human in them. It's just entirely uncanny valley. This. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was crazy because, so, okay, full disclosure, my, uh, so my sister recently got laid off, but my whole family works at Google. Mm -hmm. My brother, his girlfriend, my dad, my mom doesn't, but so, and my brother-in-law's in tech, but not Google. And so I'm terrified that the speciation event is running along this fracture line in my family where they're all looking at this stuff and like, this is awesome. And I'm sitting over here living in the middle of nowhere like, what are you doing? How is this a vision of the world where you're wearing these goggles and you're just constantly interfacing with a computer and you're not really there? And it feels like there is a complete fracture in the entire world that runs along these lines because you see people that's, that see the demo and they're in love with it already and they're the early adopters and they're full speed ahead and then you have the other people that are like i don't know that that's where we want to go because where does it end it ends in optical opto neural implants that are given to you at birth basically that will perpetually jack you into the system and i guess that's the cyborg future i just i don't see any other any other end to it where 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 else could it possibly go i think you're so too optimistic oh, oh i think oh no. it will probably be crap again this idea that we have something that creates an uh, seamless uh, interface between my imagination and uh, the physical world that i'm dropped into and i can mix and match uh, that is i think to me a very powerful and liberating concept as long as i am the one who is in charge mm. and I feel that it gives me a freedom to choose my environment. I don't need to be on an airplane. I can be in a uh, space that I create entirely for myself. And I can create the inside of my mind. And ideally, I want to have a product that is going to in, in deep resonance with my mind, that is so empathetic that it's able to read my thoughts. So I can co-create with the substrate. I can extend myself into the substrate and I can enlarge my mind. And to me, this technology is potentially a step in this direction. I'm just um, not so optimistic they can pull it off because the taste seems to be so bad at this point. But um, I'm agnostic with respect to the type of product. And I am not uh, ready yet to buy into a simplistic black and white uh, black mirror narrative. But there is a lot of stuff that I can project into black mirror, but there is also a lot of stuff that I can see in every decade that uh, puts people into an alienating world that happens to be physical and happens to be uh, 3D and uh, photons that have bounced off streets and walls and trees, but that is also not satisfying. I think what you said about it being your, of your own making is really important because my first impression when I saw this technology drop was I don't want to, I have no interest in joining into somebody else's technological vision of what my future imagination should look like so it's just not attractive to me personally but i could see it being attractive to lots of people but i want i'm interested in technology that's going to allow me like you said to be more of myself and not somebody else's vision of myself and yeah. that's that's the fine line for me 
Unfortunately, so the business it being a case flop, for yeah. self-made software doesn't seem to be good, right? And Steve Jobs had the choice of building the small talk universe where you can basically open the hood of every application and applications share code across applications and you can change out everything in real time and everything becomes user accessible and user maintainable and user designable uh, versus uh, a world where everything is closed boxes and even the developers can op only open the box if they have the pipeline open and know, have their source code and IDE tuned to this. Right? So even another developer from another company cannot open your hood and look under it and fix things and improve them. Uh, this world has much better business cases. I've been really struck recently by how difficult it is to work with the technology that we have, because the future was supposed to be this thing where everything is really streamlined and the technology allows you to be more of yourself and to accomplish more. And it's not. It's very clunky. It's difficult to navigate. Anybody who's over the age of 60, maybe, who isn't in high tech is basically screwed by their technology at this point. It is opaque. It is unbelievably difficult. I had this experience where Shiloh's dad flies radio controlled airplanes and he needed to do a firmware update for his radio controller and he couldn't figure out how to do it. So I, I was like, that's fine. I can, I can troubleshoot stuff pretty easily. It was unbelievable how many layers deep in the website this update was buried. Layers of passwords, different portals. I think he had to put it on a USB stick at the end of the day. It, it was just, it was an unbelievable collection of steps where if he didn't have someone who could walk him through it, there's no way that he would have figured it out. See, that's why we need kids. <laughs> I would uh, 100%. At this point, I mostly give it to Matt of your oldest task who would have uh, joy puzzling it out. <laughs> yeah. That's absolutely. a really good point, actually. You know, uh, the the tradition of having children to work for you is a long and storied tradition. That's definitely yes, Especially true. to fix your printer, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. For the updates, yeah. Shall we uh, turn on the audio and uh, recording? Yeah, if you if you could. We've been recording this whole time. but Oh, we'll I didn't know that. So I will turn on the audio recording on my side as well, just okay. to have a backup in case the internet is uh, not on our side. Fantastic. Um, that, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, if you want to just start off and orient people a bit to who you are yeah, and sure. the project that you're working on right now, we'll just keep going. Hello, Shiloh. Hello, Anastasia. Thank you for inviting me to your conversation. I'm Joscha Bach. I'm a cognitive scientist and AI researcher. And the reason why I went into this field is because I want to understand how the mind works. That was actually the sole reason I went into academia in the first place. And I tried to study sorts, lots of things that were related to this and tried to figure out how to um, identify those fields which had a meaningful opinion about how the mind works and could teach me something about it. And I was not very successful at first to find something. So I did study um, math a little bit and computer science and psychology and a bit of physics and I found that psychology didn't offer me theories that I could work with that were meshing in with uh, the observable reality deeply enough to understand the deep questions like what is consciousness, what is the mind, how does it relate to reality? And philosophy seemed to be stuck in uh, discussing uh, texts that they were reflecting, usually not at the same level at which the text was originally written. And so I had the impression that most of the fields were stuck. Neuroscience is mostly not about minds. It's about neurons and their uh, individual structure. The interactions of neurons are poorly understood. There is no model of from neuroscience that it can plug into a simulation and it produces interesting brain-like behavior yet. And so the only hope that I saw existed in artificial intelligence. And in some sense, artificial intelligence was started by Minsky and others to continue on the philosophical project of Leibniz and Frege and Wittgenstein to understand the mind by building one, basically closing the gap between mathematics and meaning by automating the structure that uh, is breaking down meaning into chunks that can be computed. And I realized that there has been a big constructivist turn in the last century that is largely undigested by philosophy, which basically turned the concept of mathematics into computation which said that all the mathematics that can be real, that can be implemented in the physical universe, 
is uh, characterized by moving from step to step. And this, uh, these transitions and systems that are moving from step to step, that's actually computation. And physics, in a sense, is a computational science. The universe is a computational system. Everything that is dynamic and deterministic can be described as a computational system. And the indeterministic stuff is um, not different from this. It's just, in addition, deleting some of the bits that you had computed before, if it's indeterministic. Right? So you're interested in the deterministic aspects of the whole thing. And I guess it started for me as a child when I was sitting in front of my Commodore 64 and realizing that everything that I could imagine, I could put behind that screen. And I asked myself, what is it that I would want to put behind that screen if I understand it clearly enough? And I thought an entire world, of course, with minds in it that you can talk to. And that was basically my project when I came into academia. And this was what I was trying to study for and collecting ideas in my mind for and building structure for. And then at some point, I interacted with the institutions deeply enough to understand that they wouldn't pay me for building a mind. At least not back then. I think now the situation is better because uh, AI has become much more fashionable, actually uh, a hype in the sense that a lot of people are willing to invest into niche topics of AI. And the philosophical project, which has always been an extremely niche topic, because it's something that is so risky as a philosophical project, that there's a very good chance that you're not going to succeed in your lifetime, right? That is not the stuff that you could get paid for when I was in academia. And so, in some sense, for me, the question of where to pursue this best is still open. Should we do this in a large company that is large enough to uh, uh, be able to put effort into niche topics like machine consciousness? Or should we take the opportunity that we have right now um, that so many people are interested in doing this and just build a dedicated institution that studies nothing but how to teach a machine to be conscious? I'm, oh, go ahead. I was going to say... You said that the universe is fundamentally computational, but is that how it is, or is that just a description? And if it's just a description, is it necessarily the best description of the universe? That's a metaphysical question, and the very short answer is that I think for something to exist, it has to be implemented. To be implemented and to exist are, for me, very... Um, basically identical concepts. That's the way I understand existence. And the part uh, of the universe that can be described in any language that is not self-contradictory, that is constructive, that's computation. And so if you think about computational objects, it means that you have a bunch of relationships between information. And uh, when that thing is causally relevant, so it interacts with an observer, for instance, and that includes the observer itself, it needs to be dynamic. And so at the core of everything that exists is state transitions. It's basically changes in information. And the meaning of information is its relationship to change and other information. It's a very general way to thinking about stuff. And um, curiously, if you look at the entire history of science and metaphysics, there doesn't seem to be a viable alternative to this. There's basically no other way to build representational systems in which I can think, talk, observe, about anything or in which anything can be implemented to exist than computational frameworks. So computation doesn't mean you have this particular von Neumann computer. This is not a particular kind of machine. It's more general than this. And the church Turing thesis basically says that all these systems in which we can define state transitions are ultimately equivalent to each other to the point where they run out of resources. See, the way that I look at it, Existence is a static concept, whereas dynamics and the patterns that emerge, the motions, those are all dynamic. They're dynamical. And so you have bodies, just these volumes, surface-bound volumes with inward extension that are interacting in the material sense. But the patterns that play out, the motions, all of these are, are on a completely different layer. And the, the patterns don't exist in the same physical sense. The substrate exists. The rest is occurring, right? These are occurrences because they're dynamic. But in order to describe, say, a table, I don't need any dynamics to do it. It just has an architecture, and that defines its existence because it has, we can conceive of this body, the table, and it has a location with respect to all the other bodies in the room. And so, therefore, it exists. But if I want to start talking about what the table is and how it's used and what its function is, then I'm getting into this 
idea, this realm of ideas where we're talking about its dynamics with respect to everything else, its motion and its, its purpose and all of these other layers. But fundamentally, the, the universe is a set of physical objects which are defined by being bodies with surfaces and inward extension. That table is in prototype, right? It's a way to structure your mental models of parts of reality in terms of giving you affordances of dealing with the reality around you. If you look at the actual tables, um, there are arrangements of matter that um, can be captured by this type of model that you have of a table. And I think it makes sense to treat tables not as physical objects, but as a, a way to relate to physical objects in your own mind, right? It's a way to structure reality. Reality can probably be understood as something like an evolving state vector, the universe itself. And this evolving state vector cannot be experienced as a whole, and it cannot be modeled in your mind as a whole. You cannot make useful predictions based on the assumption that it's uniformly evolving state vector. Instead, what you need to do is you take it apart into regions that are loosely coupled um, uh, between each other and strongly coupled within. And the table describes an arrangement of stuff that is strongly coupled within, in the sense that you can take it apart, but then it stops being a table. It's basically a function that you describe uh, a part of, uh, of the universe that changes more slowly than the rest of the universe with respect to you. Right? And that makes the universe manageable. The interaction between such regions that we call objects, that interact with each other, that is what we call causality. And causality becomes a model property, a property of models that are derived by separating the universe into loosely coupled interacting objects. Right. And I think that it's really important, at least in physics, that we don't get confused with the difference between objects and ideas. Because when we start treating ideas as if we can move them around and perform dynamical operations on ideas, we get confused and we don't have a baseline. It becomes a, a circular argument that has no substrate at some point. Mm -hmm. And it seems like this is at the core of so many issues in physical sciences because well, we haven't been able to separate them. doesn't get confused, right? Physics is... Uh solving this affair for itself very elegantly by um, restraining itself to the part of reality that can be described with short algebraic equations. And everything else that doesn't fit into short algebraic equations, uh, physicists ignore and they call it chemistry or biology and it's being left to other people. And so physics is a particular way of modeling the world, mostly using geometry. Yes, that's a ver but it's a very new, in the last hundred years or so, that physics has become this purely mathematical discipline. Prior to that, it was understood as a mechanical discipline that was bodies interacting with other bodies, either pushing or pulling on them. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, I feel like that's a much more sane way of approaching it, because right now physics is trying to absorb so many metaphysical problems. When they're talking about the universe and the fate of the universe and... They're, they're very existential questions in some sense, and people are happy to look to the physicists for answers on those, but I don't know that mathematics is equipped to answer cosmological questions of purpose, of meaning, of future. To me, mathematics is the domain of all languages, of all the symbol games. And mathematicians start with the simplest one, the formal languages, where you can define truths from the ground up. Whereas when you uh, try to talk about philosophical issues, uh, you have to use natural languages because it's so hard to formalize them. And that's why it's very hard to say something truthful in a natural language, because truth is so hard to define in all this ambiguity. Right? In mathematics, conversely, it's very hard to say something about the actual world that we are in, to talk about minds, feelings, emotions, uh, interaction between people, the actual economy, and so on, actual objects. But there has been progress, and this progress has been so profound that we can now use formal notations to describe many aspects of physics in satisfying ways. And, and the mathematics is a tool for notation for the most part, right? And uh, it has a similar relationship to the objects as notation has to musical objects. When you think about music, you could say that music ultimately is about making noises and uh, having uh, ideas about these noises. and often describe a space of attitudes and movements in the space of attitudes and some types of music 
It's about uh, having different types of attitudes that find a resolution among each other, or sometimes it's a progression through a space of attitudes that gets you somewhere or contracts something interesting. Right? Uh, different types of music are playing with this. There are also musics that uh, styles that do not really work on attitudes, but on other types of mathematical objects. But ultimately, music is about some kind of mathematics. And music itself is relatively easy to find a notation for. Right? You can uh, write it down uh, uh, at a very young age, and you can use it to talk to other people about the music that is in your mind, and you can also use it to talk to yourself about the music in your mind. And there is an additional layer that is not captured by the notation that allows you to interpret it. And so mm. the notation is, to some degree, constraining the piece that you are playing, and the actual art consists in the interpretation of the piece and to building additional structure in which you build a relationship to the piece. Right? So it's not just this MIDI thing, but it's the deviation from the default that becomes interesting. And physics, in the sense, is not an art like this, but it has made progress in finding notation for uh, geometrical and dynamical uh, affairs that are happening. And it's harder to learn this notation. Typically, you need to spend a decade uh, to get the basics down. So you can describe all the objects that physicists are talking about and understand their notations. But it's a similar thing. There is nothing alienating about the languages of physics. It's just that these languages are also not capable of talking about stuff like consciousness. So how do I find a notation that allows me to truthfully talk about mental phenomena? And this is something that's interesting to me. So basically, how can I mathematize this as well? How can I find a way to actually reflect about it and make proofs about it and I'll communicate about it. I worry that something is lost when we treat mathematics as a language because it's essentially quantitative adverbs and it's hard to imagine making a sentence out of quantitative adverbs. Whenever you read, you know, I, we were talking before we started, I, I just published a paper today which is highly mathematical, but it also has a lot of companion text which qualifies the mathematics and explains what the formula mean. It almost seems to me like mathematics alone has no explanatory power. It can only describe how a system behaves, but it's on the real language, say English in this case, to, to qualify what that description means about the cause and effect relationship. And I probably came from a different direction at the same problem, and I think it started with computing. You see, when I was a kid, I was blessed with having this weird Commodore 64 that has no way to talk about geometry. Like its basic programming language is very similar to assembler in there, and it doesn't have a command to draw a line or even draw a pixel on a screen. So the way in which you draw a line is that you poke a few values directly into registers of the video chip. You need to know these addresses and the values that you need to poke in to make the video chip forget how to render uh, characters on the screen and instead interpret a part of the memory as a pixel arrangement. And uh, there are a few choices that you can make of whether a pixel is composed of uh, one bit or uh, multiple bits. So you can have multiple colors or just two colors. And when you make it out of one bit, it means that one byte arrangement of eight bits is going to be mapped into eight pixels. And a group of these eight bytes is a block. And then uh, the, a block starts next to it, and you have 40 of these blocks in every line, and you have, I think, 24 blocks uh, vertically. And uh, so you can come up with a formula that you derive by yourself that tells you how to find a bit in memory that corresponds to a pixel on the screen. And once you've done this, you can create a loop that draws a line on the screen, and it's a major triumph when you figure out that puzzle. And uh, so, in some sense, I was able, as a child, to derive geometry in this way. I wrote a graphics program for myself because I didn't have one. It was 1983, 84. I was in Eastern Germany for a software that I wanted to have for the Commodore 64. Either didn't exist or was not accessible. So I wrote a program that could draw lines and that could draw ellipses and so on and combine them. It's my first graphics program. And to do this, I had to derive geometry by hand, the mathematics of geometry. and I did not realize that I was doing this. I thought mathematicians have some secret way of doing this that is much more elegant than what I was doing. And uh, the Commodore 64 also gives you an idea of how this happens in the CPU. So we realized that all the mathematics that happens in the CPU, all the basic Boolean logic, and also the basic arithmetic, like addition, um, uh, subtraction, multiplication, and division, is done with um, 
some pattern matching operation. It's basically a, a hashing function that is taking an input pattern and maps it to an output pattern in a regular way using a simple circuit. And so you realize how you can build up the entire entirety of mathematics, including geometry, including everything that you can see in the world and display in a computer game. Uh, right, dynamic objects interacting with each other, agents that reason about what they're seeing in this world and how they're interacting with you. All the stuff that we see right now in computer games and in increasing degrees of resolution is built up from these tiny, simple automata. So you realize that all of mathematics is being built like this. It starts out with finite automata and using a suitable set of finite automata is an axiomatic system. You can build anything that you can imagine. And there is, in me, my way, nothing that you cannot put into a computer. I, I wouldn't know what that should be. Right? There is nothing in physics that you cannot recreate in a computer. Some of the stuff, quantum mechanics, is not going to run efficiently on your computer. Or rather, the particles that you run via quantum mechanics are not going to run efficiently. Because I think that ultimately the premise of quantum mechanics is that the particle universe in which we are conceptualizing and perceiving ourselves is inefficiently implemented on the substrate. So there's one aspect of this, which is that there's a difference between physics and biology, right? Well, yes. And the difference is that biology emerges over the dynamics of evolvable cells, but by a cell is itself an agent. It's a system that is in some sense a very complicated super molecule that is able to model aspects of the future. And most of these models are formed implicitly through a process of evolving for a particular kind of environment and then putting subroutines into the genome of the cell that allows the cell to deal with lots and lots of different environmental circumstances that would destroy a similarly complicated and fragile molecule without that kind of regulation. Right? So basically the cell is able to deal with more complicated environments and survive in them, keep its structure stable, due to its ability to regulate aspects of the future uh, with its uh, inbuilt dynamics. And to, in order to, for that to happen, the cell needs to combine a way to uh, harvest entropy from the uh, neck entropy from the universe, basically get the energy that it needs to survive, keep its structure stable against disturbances, and it needs to have a computer. Uh, it's basically the uh, DNA with the read-write head, very similar to a Turing machine. And it needs to have a way to self-replicate. And without any of these components, life is not possible. And they're quite complex. Each of them is built via physical structures. But our biogenesis, how to get from the first cell, from something that is not biological, is very hard to understand. There are some people who are optimistic about that. Uh, you just put the right conditions in some kind of primordial soup and cells are going to pop right out. But there is no proof of this. We can get reasonably complex organic molecules, but so far not cells. And so maybe cells are very rare in the universe. And maybe we are on the only place in the universe where the cells have formed or uh, that has been infected by cells that formed somewhere else in our solar system under more favorable conditions. Maybe cells are really require some freakish accident for them to happen. But once you have cells, biology is easy because you get evolution. I think that I object to the idea that the definition of life is a cell because I think that I define life as a form of matter that's able to desire things and then to change the world to fit its desires. And I think that that process begins before you get a cell. I think that the cell is the manifestation of progressively more complex organizations of matter that are able to change the future by virtue of existing. I'm not sure if I'm willing to attribute desire to cells even. And probably not to process this before cells. I don't think that the virus is desire. I think of a virus as something like a text fragment that the cell cannot help but read uh, to enact its code. And I don't think that the virus itself is multi-stable, and so it's not actually living. It's not able to survive without injecting itself into a cell that is producing all the necessary dynamics to make the virus function in the way it does. And there is nothing simpler than a cell that is performing these functions. 
And it's arrangement of cells that give rise to systems that represent themselves. And I think that desire is a property of a system that observes itself desiring, that has a concept of itself wanting something. It's not just an implementation of uh, a thermostat that is trying to keep the temperature stable. I don't think that the temp uh, thermostat it has a desire in this regard. Right? Uh, and also don't think that there is something magical that needs to be added to the thermostat to turn it into an agent. It's basically all just functionality that needs to be added. But desire is the property of systems that represent their own agency. It seems like, again, I think if I can clarify what Anastasia is getting at is that there seems to be a confusion again between the idea of life, which is a phenomenon, and the objects which exhibit the phenomenon, which is the organism, the cell, right? Well, yeah, because you say that it's not possible for a cell that can't conceptualize itself to have a desire. Yes, I'm to some degree agnostic with respect to this because I have no proof for the upper bound of the complexity of a cell. But I don't know uh, if there could be cells which think and which perceive in a meaningful sense. I think it's conceivable that some do. But uh, I suspect that there are cells which are rather dumb and quite mechanical in uh, their interaction with the world. I, I find it fascinating that you seem to... Uh, think that life is something that exists independently of the structures that implement, implement it. It's almost as if your ideas, your concepts that you form by observing lots of things uh, are um, breaking free from your observations and develop an inner life and uh, run amok in your mind. Are you sure that you should leave them off the leash? Because uh, the life that you're talking about is an abstraction that is ultimately always bound to observations that you made. And I don't think that you were able to observe the phenomena of life outside of anything that has been constructed of or by cells. Well, I think that cells are the natural progression of this kind of organization of matter. But I think that, and this is kind of reaching back to the idea of the Elan Vital, right? The idea that there's some animating force. And we abandoned it because it seemed too spooky and religious and... No, no. We abandoned it because there was no evidence for it. Well, what, it was an idea to describe why stuff is animated and is moving. It was not that anybody had ever observed it. But So my point is this. Okay, so we have a vision of the origin of life that mm -hmm. is cellular in nature. Life begins when the first cell forms. And we can't solve that problem because there's no way for us to bring together the components of cells and then to produce a cell. And do you know do you know Michael Levin? Do you know his work? Mm -hmm. Yes. And one of the things that he always says is he's like, look, the the strength of your f scientific philosophy has to do with what it allows you to accomplish. And for for decades now we've had this way of looking at the cell as or or of an organism as being the product of molecule target interactions where you have molecules that interact with receptors those receptors come into the cell they do something it's this very mechanistic ratchet machine right you can simplify it to a bunch of gears that are all spinning and so it's a machine that has outputs but he has a radically different way of looking at it right he's like look the thing that drives Life is will, it's desire. And so if we can control the desire of the cells by giving them the proper input, since we understand what it is that the, the, the map between input and desire, then we can get them to do crazy things. And he accomplishes this with his regenerative medicine experiments where he can make the body plan of these planarians change without affecting the DNA. And the fact that you can do that to me suggests that our concept of life as cells isn't fully fleshed out because if you have a state of matter that is you know gas solid liquid plasma life then the problem of how cells arise becomes a question of how does matter organize itself in isolated conditions that propagate iteratively towards the production of a stable body that is then more effective than the molecules themselves. And, and to, to, 
to say where that might be happening. There's a lot of research into the deep biosphere that suggests that there's a layer of the earth that you can go down deep enough into where the line between chemistry and cells is blurred. And these are really, really hard experiments to do because the, the people who have done them historically have been going into mines in South Africa, five miles deep into the ground, finding these weird communities at the bottom of boreholes. And it's really difficult work to do. And so no one's been able to really map that line of, hey, where does chemistry transition into biological molecules and then biological molecules into cells because our our technological ability still lags behind the questions that we ask. It's a very, very difficult thing to do on a biological level if you're applying the tools of biology to be able to map the line between molecules, complexity, and cells. This kind of thinking is a lot too vague for me. I think uh, you need to be much more concrete. In my conversation okay. with Michael Levin, he did not attribute to will to cells, and maybe this is because he didn't get around to it. Uh, the way in which he characterizes the interaction between cells might in uh, include something like individual cells are not um, performing a particular task because they are mechanically forced to, but because they are bullied by the environment into this particular task, not so much unlike an individual in a society fulfilling a very specialized role in large part because the environment bullies them into it so they can survive. They need to find a niche and adapt to it and specialize, right? And uh, this is a similarity to how the cells behave. And the uh, cells behave like this because uh, they have enough degrees of freedom as per their genetics to find a specialization given the right environment. And not all cell types are able to do this and will not be able to survive under these conditions. It's still all very mechanical. And when we talk about will in the context of cells, the question is, are you using a metaphor? And uh, more importantly, when you talk about will outside of the context of cells, are you still using a metaphor? Or do you actually know what it means? Are you able to formalize your understanding of what it means for a system to have a will? Does, do you understand what it means for a system to desire something? Can you break this down to its lowest basic components? What are the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to have a will or for something to have a desire? I think I, I, I think I can, because mm -hmm. we talked to Carl Friston, and our conversation with Carl Friston was kind of about this, where mm -hmm. his concept of the free energy principle, I think, outlines this. And then we talked to this guy, Brett Kagan, who built this thing at Cortical Labs, which is a chip with neurons on it that they trained to play Pong. Did you see this? Okay. Yes. So, so do the you want to try uh, to find uh, will or desire? Yeah, I think that will is or d desire is, so organisms, cells, whatever you want to call it, life has a way of pattern matching expectation to reality. And when expectation and reality align, then there is equilibrium. But when expectations and reality are misaligned, will is the process by which those are brought back into alignment and life is the only thing that can do that i think shyla's cheering i appreciate that shyla <laughs> i i just think we have to be really really careful here to separate out the physical bodies the organisms from the phenomenon the occurrence of life which which is what is on the table in terms of perhaps occurring at a level prior to the organisms themselves, which is, I think, what Anastasia is talking about. I mean, I think it really comes down to, do you believe in hypotheses? Do you think hypotheses are a necessary part of understanding the universe? Because these are things which, in Descartes' definition, are sufficient to prove the theory, but are not necessarily assumed to be true. So you have to make these leaps like, well, it's possible. It's It really comes down to whether it's possible or not when you're generating hypothesis. Is it possible that this fundamental phenomenon, life, is occurring at other levels besides the ones that we have empirically observed? Uh, and the it's, deeper question is, can the words that you're using do the work that you are assigning to them? 
But uh, when you say life, you, you are referring to conceptual structure and the conceptual structure needs to refer to causal structure. And the causal structure needs to interact with all the other components of your model of the universe. And uh, when I say life I, uh, and I say it cells, I don't mean that there are no other equivalent structures in the universe that behave in a similar way to cells, right? I'm completely open to that. I can also simulate stuff in a computer that behaves a lot like cells and has similar qualities. When I decide to not call this life, or uh, then it's a terminological decision. It's not some deep philosophical statement that I'm making. It's just when I, I think about what biologists have been studying when they talked about life and they pointed into nature and stuff moving in there, they were very puzzled about what it was. And at some point they reached a, a tacit agreement. And this tacit agreement is really the dynamics of cells and uh, viruses are not included because they are below that level. Right, and uh, the uh, a car, for instance, is built by an arrangement of cells, but itself is not life. Even if the car is self-driving, it's not alive. Well, hold on, and hold even on, if hold the on, car hold would on. be self-reproducing, the... it would not be alive, according to most biologists. And if you were to try to change that definition, you can do this, and maybe you find it helpful in some contexts. And uh, I just make sure that you, you still keep a word that allows you to talk about the dynamic of cells. Right? It's entirely conceivable that there is stuff that is indistinguishable from what biological cells are doing on Earth that are not based on carbon, but that use completely different chemistry. Maybe there are other solutions for building stuff that is cell-like. And there might also be uh, solutions for building self-organizing systems that adapt to changing circumstances via evolution or construction. Right? And uh, they could also maybe not be based on some membrane with cell replicators, but maybe it's, there is some other principle that makes them possible. And uh, whether we call this life or not, ultimately, is, is not important. It just need to make sure that we are pointing at the right thing or at the same thing when we are using the word. Right? That is, is not an issue for me. There. So this is not where we deviate. But uh, when you say that control is will, then I have a disagreement with you because what you described uh, with respect to a system that measures a deviation from some kind of target value, and when there is a deviation, uh, is unfolding a dynamic to reduce this deviation. There is a name for this. It's called control. And the thermostat has that already. And I wouldn't say that the thermostat has will. That is basically putting too, uh, too much depth into what the thermostat is doing. Because if a person would be acting like a thermostat, I would not say that this person is acting out of a desire or as a will, it could be also a compulsion. Right? There are many ways in which people do things uh, that are directed on a goal that are unrelated to desire and will. Desire and will are much more specific terms, and I wouldn't want to mush them up. Uh, another thing that is important is trace where a term comes from, and not necessarily where it comes from in the outer genealogy of scholarship, but where does it come from in your own mind? At which point did you form this concept? What does this concept actually refer to in your own mind? Reverse engineer this. Break this down into actual observables and generalizations over observables. That, that, that is for me the way in which I think. So when I talk about will, I talk about a phenomenon that exists from the perspective of a willed observer or of some observer who is observing you a similar dynamic. You can't use the word in else. the definition. Mm -hmm. You can't use the word in the definition. So of define course. will without using will. Uh, you, I think you can do it. Right? A will is a representation of uh, an intention that is upstream from the self. There's a, uh, some, some uh, slight differences. There are people which have will outside of their self, and there are some people which have it inside of their self. Right? What happens in this difference is that when you have will outside of yourself, you experience yourself wanting something, but you don't have control over what you want. You are just the, the thing that is tasked with making that happen. Right? So you have, are forced by your will to do things. There is a part outside of your control, it's still outside of your mind, that is producing an intention that is directing your behavior, that uh, something is committed to. And uh, that typically uh, is uh, happening in the service of some control task that you, your mind has established with respect to the environment. But uh, th what's crucial about the will is this uh, internal representation in which you experience it as a motive force that you have to resolve. There is another sense in which will can exist. Some people uh, do not seem to experience this will outside of themselves, but instead what they experience is pleasure and pain and uh, purposes. And then they have to uh, find a goal by themselves to resolve the pleasure and pain and to uh, realize appetence and avoid aversion. 
And uh, so the will is something that is created inside of the reflexive mind, right? This motive force that keeps them going. But it's mostly a, a redirection of pleasure and pain into action. And uh, so in some sense, there are different architectures of the self with, with, uh, on top of the mental architecture of control that we have that give uh, rise to different types of understanding will or different notions of will that we observe in different psychologies. But will is always something that seems to be dependent on an observer that is conceptualizing a self model and it exists with respect to that self. I'm not sure if the cell has a self model. I guess that even if uh, some might do, which I somewhat doubt, I don't have too little evidence for it, the majority of cells probably don't have a self model. So cells are giant PID controllers in your world, and only the assembly of them allows for the emergence of will? I think that cells are not coupled richly enough to the environment to uh, uh, make it necessary for conceptualizing uh, their own agency from the perspective of an observer. So uh, the cell can probably, for the most part, perform its actions without bu uh, building explicit representations about them. So and they're actually not advanced representations like their own agency. So they're acting entirely under that external will paradigm? No, there is not necessarily a will involved. They're just mechanical, in the same way as a thermostat. Oh, but uh, the you said something really interesting, which is that you don't think that cells are sufficiently coupled to their external environment. And I come at this from a microbiology perspective. So I did my PhD in biofilms and specifically in electrical signaling in biofilms. And so we studied these little molecules called phenazines that change their oxidative state and they get shuttled around the biofilm. And the state of their oxidation is informing gene transcription, cell behavior, everything. So you have this complex system inside the biofilm that is mediated by electrical signaling. And you put that in front of somebody and they're like, well, that's just cells doing stuff. But I'm like, to me, that seems that if you run that program for long enough, you end up organically at multicellularity and bodies and progressively more and more complex systems. and everybody's always looking for the place where, like, where does this quality evolve? Where does this quality appear? At what point of complexity does it suddenly come into being that you can have will? And my thought is that the will exists in a really simple rudimentary form inside of those cells, the bacteria that are tightly coupled to their environment. They have so much information coming into them and the set point that is maintained inside of them is so much more complicated than a thermostat. Like, have you ever looked at a diagram of cellular metabolism in a bacteria that can use like 15 different substrates to grow off of? I have no doubt that it's uh, complex. The question is if there's a representation. And I think for a will, you need a second order representation. Because you need something that is conceptualizing itself as an agent and is observing itself doing that. You need to have some kind of a reflexive self-model to have will. But it's a technical definition. It's, there is nothing normative involved. It's not that I require something to breach the magical complexity barrier. I require it to have a particular causal structure. And I am open to the possibility that cells might turn out having such causal structure. That's not the point. Just read Greg Beer's uh, book, uh, Blood uh, Music. And um, it's written in the 1980s. It's a science fiction novel that is absolutely brilliant, but it's terribly written. It reads like doctor's fiction. It's, um, so the style of writing is un almost unbearable to me. Um, it's like Asimov. But uh, the, um, the idea is brilliant. And he basically describes uh, the end game of AGI taking over uh, the planet, but he describes it via biotech. It starts out with some uh, guy in San Diego uh, reading lymphocytes that uh, have the ability to make their DNA read right and have a feedback loop through the RNA and uh, in this way wake up because they become self-editing and general function approximators. And then he uh, trains them to solve labyrinths and gets the individual lab uh, lymphocytes uh, to the intellectual level of a mouse. And then he is forced to stop the experiments because his employer doesn't want him to and he carries the experiment home by injecting his own modified lymphocytes back into his body and triggering no, no. Armageddon. And 
Okay, so immediately, I'm from a scientific perspective, I don't think that you can get the lymphocyte to solve the maze. But if you trigger the lymphocyte to turn into a multicellular organism, then you probably could. Because what you need in order to reach that kind of solving complexity is a interrelated set of modules that are able to feed back onto each other and then to get many pieces of information about the real external state versus the thing that they want. Yes, and so I it's agree. like there are multiple issues with this uh, uh, story that he wrote. Uh, the the one that you're pointing at is, of course, he made his labyrinth extremely small, and he built it in such a way that the receptors of the cell are sufficient to get a sense of the environment in this labyrinth, and they can navigate it. But there, of course, there is a difference because the mouse is using optical sensors in addition to uh, touch. And so the mouse is able to see over a large distance in a way that is more difficult for a cell to achieve because it doesn't really have eyes. And even if it has photoreceptors that are somewhat directional, it's not going to get anywhere close to eyes, right? So it's going to be difficult for the cell to make a model of space at the same uh, speed as the mouse would be doing it. And the other one that is more profound, I think, is that uh, Greg Beer overestimates the capabilities of the mechanical computer built inside of the cell. So basically, even if you speed this up and give it more memory and so on, it's still going to be awfully slow. And it's because you cannot really parallelize what's going on in the individual cell in the same way as you can parallelize stuff in the brain. So you, you can deal with the fact that the brain is awfully slow, but the uh, brain is faster than the operations on DNA and RNA because uh, just sending a signal through cells is built in such a way that the cell only needs to trigger an internal switch that is uh, that's much faster than performing read-write operations internally. Right? The cell is also performing some read-write operations while it does that, but it does not need to wait for the result. It's able to do this on the site and offline and is fine with these results being available with the delay of hundreds of milliseconds maybe, or at least tens of milliseconds or sometimes seconds, as long as the signal can pass through. Uh, quickly enough and gets modulated in the right way almost instantaneously. And still the brain is working at roughly the speed of sound rather than at an appreciable uh, fraction of the speed of life, uh, light as uh, computers do that we are building. Right? So uh, I think the capabilities of even a really pumped up cell are going to be far below the capabilities of, a, of even a nervous system. And I might be wrong, so I might be missing uh, possibilities of what can be created in the uh, chemistry of a cell in terms of computation. And uh, for instance, Lee Cronin is, has his big hopes for compu uh, computation of building um, Turing machines entirely out of chemical operations without having mechanical parts in a sense. And he hopes that he can uh, make them much faster. And it's to be a very interesting open empirical question how fast this can go. But what we see is that these smarter organisms on the planet are typically many, many cells that have uh, particular metabolic enhancements for making these cells work very fast and send information very quickly so they can perform uh, rich computations about the world. And this being coupled means that you have many sensors that are working in many modalities quite reliably with a lot of redundancy over large distances where you see meaningful differences in the world and over which you want to integrate. Do you, all right, when I look at the AI landscape, I use a number of the AI tools in my daily life. I sense nothing even approximating life in them. I sense no sense of this will, for lack of a better word. It, no, no sense of the ability to actually come up with new ideas. This, the ability to conceptualize is, seems highly unique to life itself. They're very useful in assisting me when I have an idea and how I and and I know how to execute it, and I can get assistance. But when I hear these futuristic visions of this artificial general intelligence, it doesn't seem like a natural leap from what I see in the world today being called artificial intelligence. It doesn't seem like a a, a steady linear evolution. Am I? missing something? Is there something incredible going on behind the scenes that I'm not aware of? I guess if I were sitting down with a few computer scientists and we were pointing at philosophers and we would say, there's nothing in this realm which reminds me of life. There's nothing creative there. 
there is no meaningful interaction with the world in which we in interact. Right? Right. Uh, uh, you could say that from some angle and some abstraction to some projection that you can make, that's approximately true. But if you were a philosopher, you'd probably think it's grossly unfair. Oh, and, well, hold on, uh, hold on, hold on, hold mm -hmm. on, hold on. I want to clarify that. Because what Shiloh is saying is he's saying that in the process of interacting with the tools and the kinds of responses that you get, there's something about talking to a human being where you say something that's imperfect and that being can understand what it is that you're saying, integrate it, match it onto something that is outside of your experience and build upon it. And so if you were interacting with someone, there's always the feeling that there's life there. And it, it would be hard to interact with another human being and walk away thinking that there's no life there. But you can interact with a computer program, I think is what Shiloh is saying. I mean, I think it all hinges on the ability to conceptualize. And what I mean by that is the most primary form of concept is a physical concept where two bodies are interacting, say one body crashes into another. But from there, you can get higher levels of conceptualization, which terminate in these things we call ideas. And nobody really knows where ideas come from. Obviously, if you're a theorist or an artist or whatever, you have this experience that an idea just hits you all of a sudden. And when you're having a conversation with a human being, you're often generating ideas between the two of you. But I've never had anything approximating that experience with an AI interaction. I don't sense that they have the ability or will ever have the ability to conceptualize. How do you know that nobody knows where ideas come from? <laughs> uh, maybe you can tell me where ideas come from. You know, I, I have an impression that I can usually trace where my ideas come from. Interesting. You know, I, I write a lot of music and often, not often, but occasionally a piece of music will come to me fully formed. I'll just have a vision of it. Other times I'll sit down at the piano or with a guitar and I feel music coming into my hands. It's a very, it's a very strange feeling, but I'm sure that Anybody who's out there who is an artist has experienced this. And it doesn't seem like it's being rationalized in the moment. How do you feel that this is different when you are prompting an AI model to produce a picture? Oh, I, I do. I feel like I'm giving it the ideas, exactly. That's, I feel like I am the idea generator when I'm interacting with AI. But when I'm having a human interaction, say I'm playing music with another person, I feel like that person is generating ideas as well. And we're both making a new vision by combining our individual abilities to generate ideas to conceptualize. Whereas I don't have that experience with AI. I feel like I'm the one doing the ideas and the thing is just sort of doing what I tell it. I find that my own mind is more like mid journey than it is like Dali when I produce ideas. I'm basically prompting uh, my cortex to generate a solution to some creative problem that I have. And creativity for me involves three things. There's first of all, novelty, something that was not known to me or anybody in my direct environment before in such a way that is already there for me. Uh, the second one is that it needs to be somewhat disruptive, which means it's not the result of just following the gradient to the most obvious solution, but there needs to be some reorganization of the space necessary, basically some jump into the darkness and landing on the other side you basically bridge a discontinuity in the search space if it's meant to be truly creative. This doesn't mean that the other stuff doesn't exist. Very often you just have a design problem where you are following a gradient and you come up with the best solution under the circumstances. It's an optimization problem and creativity often goes beyond the simple optimization problem by having to find a new representation. And the third one is authorship, which means it's transformative. I get changed to the creative act in such a way that I cannot do it again while being creative, which means I integrate the outcome of the creative process and it changes me into something that has already done that. So I now have that representation, I already know how it works and I can do the next step. And uh, arguably this last part is missing in the current uh, breed of AI models, but it's something that in principle could be integrated, which means that we train the output of the model again into the model at every step. And the model remembers at this as something that it has done is also remembering all the interactions that it has to be with the environment. And in this sense, it becomes a discernible voice 
And I think this would be a, a prerequisite for turning an AI model into something that is able to create art. At the moment, it's not in my perspective. It is producing artifacts that look a lot like art, but they don't fit the, my technical definition of art yet. Uh, Dali has a wide range of styles that it's going to produce, whereas Midjourney always has a particular aesthetic. And that's why I say my mind is more like Midjourney, because in most of the stuff that my mind is creating, I recognize my own aesthetics. And I'm able to go away from this and emulate other aesthetics to some degree. But uh, usually I recognize myself by default. So I'm biased towards a particular kind of aesthetics in my own mind, even when I'm creative. But do you ever think that the computational systems, the artificial intelligence, will ever reach a point where they're able to look at the landscape in any particular domain? Say they look at all of the data concerning... I don't know how the atom behaves and they're able to actually suggest a theory, a new concept to you. Hey, I think you humans are looking at it all wrong. It's actually like this. This is the cause and effect situ uh this is the cause and effect explanation. Yes, of Do course. you think that that level of conceptualization is possible because I've yeah. seen no hint of it whatsoever. Without, without being asked, I think is the important part of this. Without you telling it, you are an AI that focuses on atomics. And solving the question, the specific question of gravitation, or the specific yep. question there of electromagnetism. There is a problem with the current generation of AI models. They are Fristonian, radically Fristonian. The only thing that they do is basically to uh, minimize the free energy. They try to minimize the prediction error. They tr make a prediction, and then during training, that's what the transformer is doing, and then they minimize uh, the deviation between the observed thing and uh, what they predicted by changing the structure of the model. They do this gradually. And the transformer is a way to optimize this process. In some sense, it's what uh, almost all neural network paradigms are doing. It does this by uh, making statistics over. We need to make the statistics over, so the training becomes more efficient. And it introduces a way to make this in parallel. So you can use many GPUs in parallel to process the entirety of text on the internet or hundreds of millions of pictures simultaneously. Otherwise, uh, this brute force training method wouldn't work. And our own mind works in a very different way. It is based on optimizing for coherence, I think. And consciousness is a tool for achieving this coherence in a self-organizing substrate. So basically, to becoming a, a coherent observer, you need to establish the notion of being a coherent observer. And consciousness is related to doing this. You notice when you are conscious that you have a percept of being a reflexive observer, which basically means there is a control process going on that is checking whether you are actually still a coherent observer or spacing out. And by implementing this control process, your uh, observation process is able to keep itself stable. And the process of that uh, observation process is to construct coherence in the world where it's not readily apparent. And so we don't just try to minimize the deviation from expectation when we observe the world. Instead, first of all, we try to filter all, all those parts that we can interpret in some sense and ignore the rest. And we have a fringe around this, some boundary, where we gradually, step by step, increase the amount of stuff that we can interpret coherently. And this is all happening in the service of agency. Right? We build our models um, for aesthetic reasons, but ultimately, your uh, neurons are being paid to discover structure for uh, producing your ability to change the universe itself, to, so you can survive and make the future compatible with you. Right? And it's something that we don't do for the present AI systems. They are not built to maximize their own agency, and they are not even built to maximize their coherence yet. Coherence is something that forms in the limit. If you give them more data, they become more and more coherent until they approximate coherence to a sufficient degree to convince people who are playing with these models that they are talking to something that is more coherent than most people are. And this is also the other issue. We talk to a bunch of philosophers who tell you, uh, AI models don't understand uh, what understanding means. But you ask the philosophers, and they all agree that they don't uh, have a shared understanding of what understanding means. So AI models might be our only chance to get there because well, so, uh, brain is so small. But that, okay, so that's an interesting thing, which is that the brain is so small. And so if we are limited by the complexity of our brains. To go back to the lymphocyte example, you have a lymphocyte that you put into the maze. There's a limit to how fast it can solve it because there's a limit to the amount of parallel processing that can go on inside of a cell rather than inside of a brain. 
Mm-hmm. And so we accept that there's a difference in ability between a cell and a brain. And so we should also assume that there is a difference, a, a complexity ramp between brains and a network of brains. Because your network will be a product of the complexity of all of the parts because that's the number of processes that you can run. Okay. So, to my mind, the complexity inside of an AI system doesn't necess- doesn't reflect the complexity inside of a brain. And so if we want to ramp our intelligence to the next level... What we have to have is a network of brains, not a network of AIs that are less complex than brains. Because the AI model right now, if you ask it what is understanding and it doesn't have a good definition for it, it doesn't have a good definition for it because in all of its training data, there isn't an explanation that it can find. It's limited by its training data. And it has no demonstrated ability to come up with its own explana- its own definition set that that's, is more coherent. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Where it's, if the training data set doesn't have anything that approximates that explanation, it doesn't have the ability to do this next order modeling, which is, okay, this is how explanations are arrived at, and I have to do this process with all of the data that is available to me in order to get to a place that doesn't exist in the data. And it seems like people believe that it's possible to teach AI to do that, but you'd have to mathematically conceptualize what it means to arrive at an explanation. And that's where that weird thing of where the hell does an idea come from begin? Because if you're sitting somewhere and all of a sudden out of nowhere you just have an insight... And you're like, I don't know how I got that insight. There's not two or three things that I connect that linearly produce this this emergence of, of, of something new. You can't mathematically program that because it's 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 random. It's it's a collection of things just in the right moment. Your own resonant internal state is at this receptive place where this sounds crazy, but I think that we we agree that biology has a lot to do with phonons, with the resonance inside of materials. And so the resonant inside of your brain at that moment is just right to be able to catch on to the resonance of something that's outside of it, and then from that to produce an idea. But that to me seems computationally intractable to give to a machine unless you have something that is this wet, squishy thing that can resonate which is the brain in this model. I think that's a not secret for There are many good uh, observations that you're making. For instance, you observe that your reflexive self is uh, for the most part unable to observe your idea generation process. And there are many obvious reasons for this, right? Uh, it's uh, often a feedforward network that is uh, built in such a way that it can uh, its uh, function cannot be decomposed into a grammatical structure that you could rationally trace. So basically building a perceptual system that is working on your mental processes would be hard uh, if you are using a feedforward network with a high degree of parallelism and superposition in the states that are being computed. And uh, phonons are a very good metaphor, I think, for a lot of what's happening in the brain. Um, there's a, a book by... Um, um, what's um, the RT guy? Let me check. Just blanking out. Grossberg, uh, adaptive oh, resonance we have him coming theory. in the show next week. Yes, he's really great. And, uh, he basically tries to uh, describe the entirety of processes in the nervous system as resonance processes. And I think it's a very productive paradigm. Uh, at this point, I think nobody has turned this into a computational model that produces all this. But there um, are um, many good ideas in, in this framework. But uh, it's still uh, computational. There is nothing that is paradigmatically different. It's just a particular way to look at the computations. And uh, I keep saying that I guess that sometimes a better metaphor for what the brain is doing is not circuitry, but it's something like an ether. So which activation waves are propagating in the medium of the propagation are neurons and adjacent cell types that are taking the signal and reaching it forward to other cells while modulating it. Right? And we, all the computations are taking place in these activation fronts. And these activation fronts, in order to, for that thing to work, need to be periodic. So there's basically cyclical waves that are passing through the neural substrate and producing behavior. And this uh, spreading of these activation fronts is so slow that it's roughly at the speed of sound. So phonons is not a bad metaphor. 
And uh, very often the neurons are not deterministic, which means that uh, given the same environmental uh, configuration, the neuron is not going to go into a single particular state, but in one out of multiple states, because they're not completely deterministic. And this means that if you want to guarantee getting a particular kind of result from this, you need a bunch of neurons. So statistically, of them, most of them are going to get into that state. But what the others are going to do is that they sample a space of functions that is adjacent to the result that you want. And this gives you sometimes more power because instead of having to train your neurons to perform one function only, you can constrain them to uh, compute a bunch of functions simultaneously and then voting on the outcome of the results. Mm. And so it's a, a slightly different paradigm in thinking about how this computation works in the brain compared to our digital computers, which I think is responsible for the fact that our brains are so efficient despite being so abysmally slow and unreliable. And it if sounds you like look you're at the graphics card, they have so much larger memory than our brains and are so much faster. Why are they so less, uh, so little, if more efficient than what our brain is? It sounds like you're saying that crossing this conceptual barrier requires a hardware shift in the pursuit of artificial intelligence. Not necessarily. I know a bunch of people who are working on neuromorphic chips. And my own intuition is that if your main task is or main mission in life is to figure out how the mind works, uh, don't start with building hardware and then trying to figure out how to get software to run on them, but uh, simulate your hardware first on your GPU. And there is some evidence that for most of the existing um, neuromorphic chips, you can simulate them on a GPU. And that's uh, basically running software that works like this uh, requires you con to constrain yourself to something that um, only works in the way in which a neuromorphic chip does and not using the, all the capabilities of the hardware. So basically, it seems that our hardware is luring us into using classes or algorithms that are suboptimal because the hardware is so powerful. With, with biology, it feels like a lot of its functionality comes down to resonance and mm -hmm. these multiple states of resonance that layer onto each other and then produce action. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to encode analog resonance digital? into a digital system? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. The thing is that the analog resonance has a finite resolution. The resolution is actually usually quite small until it gets drowned out in noise. And it's similar to having an analog record on a very coarse vinyl substrate. Right? To, get, uh, to build a CD-ROM that is able to exceed this resolution of the analog substrate is not hard. It's just a design solution that you're taking. And uh, so in some sense, if you are willing to accept that your software needs to be slightly different on every substrate, you could build uh, noisy analog chips that require less energy to run uh, than uh, deterministic digital chips. But the, the price is that you, your software needs to be adaptive, that it needs to deal with how your hardware feels today. Yeah, and that seems to be something that is key to biology. It's the, it's the adaptability, it's the fact that today you don't feel like you did yesterday. And so the product of everything that you do is different. And I think that that's not a bug in the software, I feel like that's actually a function for creativity and evolution and desire and will. And I mean, I, I, I think that it starts well before the complexity of a human where that's the case. I once woke up after a major surgery and asked people how the surgery went while being still in the um, ER. And uh, they told me and they were visibly disturbed and I asked them what was going on and they told me they had the exact conversation like you know, for the third time. And it was because uh, part of the uh, anesthesia that I've got inhibited long-term memory formation. It was still active while I was in the ER. So I would not have been able to form a long-term memory trace of the conversation that I had. It was only playing out in working memory and then I fall asleep, woke up again and had the same conversation pretty much word for word. This means that my macroscopic behavior is pretty deterministic. And the reason why it doesn't repeat is because I form memory that uh, stops me from repeating, right? Because I don't need to do it again. It's also the reason why older people repeat themselves because they don't form no long-term memory traces of the conversation. That's terrifying. Yes, it is. I don't know. I think that that's actually fits really neatly into my picture of nature where 
life is a form of long-term memory formation. The structure itself of this heritable information that is modulated over the course of your life and then passed down to your offspring through an epigenetic mechanism is basically the whole point of life. And it seems pretty straightforward that on a processing level, it's relatively easy to, f to, to lose that when some system goes offline. But that just speaks to the way that our brains are a more complex version of what life is already doing on the most basic level. Don't know how much information we can actually pass on epigenetically to our offspring. And ultimately, I think that's um, not a question of what's the most poetic interpretation of reality, but an empirical question. Uh, so I don't know how much racial memory I've got epigenetically or from my parents. Um, who knows? Maybe we figure it out. But uh, I suspect that most of the stuff is just passed on genetically and the rest is observation. There are probably a few bits that can be encoded during the lifetime of my parents into sperm and eggs and then expanded in the next generation. But I suspect it's not that much because this recording mechanism would be very hard to implement. And so I suspect that most of the transmission of information across generations happens by explicit uh, um, uh, um, communication between parents and children. You you might be right to to some degree because there is a uh, the twin studies are an interesting insight into this because you can take people that are twins that are raised under different conditions and then you find out what contribution is maintained on a genetic basis and what contribution seems to be defined by environmental considerations. But from what I can tell, you know, actually I don't know enough about this. I have to read more twin studies in order to be able to evaluate how much is. I think that there's a romantic hope that um, the, we can break out of the genetic determinism via some magical epigenetic mechanism, but I suspect this is not going to work. Hmm. <laughs> I want to go back to what you were talking about with the hardware advancements that are necessary to produce anything approximating artificial general intelligence. And it occurred to me that in a digital system, you might have a very high level of resolution. You mentioned the CD versus the vinyl. But when it comes to actually recording the information in the first place, people who work in audio recording prize analog equipment because, well, not because it is high fidelity, but because of the harmonic distortion that it introduces. And I wonder how much of our conscious experiences are predicated on that harmonic distortion mm. in a constructive sense that it adds a level of richness to our experience that wouldn't be possible in a digital system. I suspect that a lot of the limitations of digital equipment are due to um, cost reduction. Basically, in order to make this thing work, it's not going to uh, exploit the limit of what's technologically possible. But it makes measurements on a number of subjects in a lab under controlled conditions. And when uh, the subjects are no longer perceiving any kind of difference to the analog signal, uh, that you're done, right? You don't need to be much better. Maybe you put in some safety margin and then you're good. And then you can basically scientifically prove that you now have a recording that has higher quality than vinyl. But uh, the uh, this thing is uh, working based on some assumption. For instance, when you look at an RGB screen, the uh, pigments of the RGB screen are producing signals that are tuned to your receptors. But there are interpersonal differences between the receptors. Some people are diff uh, sensitive to slightly different wavelengths. So if you only use three types of emitters for light to uh, simulate the entire spectrum, you're not going to get the same result for everybody. And this uh, similar thing is happening with audio. Basically, there are people which are way more sensitive in some frequency areas than others. And if you have an analog medium, uh, your brain has to piece out from this analog uh, distortion uh, what the result is. And there are no gaps in this analog signal. There's basically this smooth property of the signal. And uh, that is something that I couldn't appreciate so much when I was younger. And now I notice that when I look at uh, heavily processed uh, digital film material, that I often feel that I see uh, differences in the grain 
where uh, some filter has been applied and then the filter stops being applied and this annoys me like i look at um, the villeneuve dune and i look at the cgi and it's very unsatisfying to me because i feel that uh, the foreground and the background doesn't match there's something completely wrong i cannot put my finger onto it and so when i look at the much more primitive uh, uh, tricks in a Kobozara movie that are entirely analog uh, I find it's much more digestible because I don't see this cut off I, it feels to me that there is some kind of smooth continuum into it but I'm still not willing to romanticize this into thinking that uh, analog is in principle superior to digital but uh, it could be that if you want to get something that is completely equivalent uh, we need to do a much higher resolution on the digital substrate I mean, there's been an incredible advancement in the last 10 years in the audio recording realm, which is where I'm most comfortable, which is that you create plugins, you create modules which are capable of introducing that harmonic distortion, but you have to know that you want it in the first place, and you have to know that you're modeling something in the analog world and that that distortion turns out to be really important. Mm -hmm. When people first started getting all of this high-tech digital equipment in the 90s, they were immediately struck by how cold and despite all of its high fidelity, it sounded awful. And they had to really go back and analyze what it was in those particular distortions that they wanted to keep. And there's really a high art to introducing those distortions in a way that keeps the music pleasant to the ear while actually ruining the high fidelity of the signal. It's, it's an interesting paradox. I noticed the weird thing that uh, when I uh, look at audio recordings from classical music, there are a lot of recordings I cannot relate to, and a few that uh, work much, much better. And I talked to some of the pianists, and I had the impression that there is some correlation between the pianist being a synesthete and this work music working on me. And uh, they uh, describe a similar thing that sometimes they have the wrong piano and they're not able to experience synesthesia while playing it. And so it mm. doesn't work for them. And the synesthesia relates to your brain going into resonance at some level using, obviously it has to do with overtones in the music that uh, you may not consciously perceive when you listen to it, but it has something to do with, because you're not reflecting on it, with how your perceptual system is processing the data. And this gap between how perception works and how your mental conductor is listening to what uh, the instruments of your mind are producing is responsible for some difference. So you might not be consciously noticing difference between stimuli, but your brain might be. And so this thing that you notice that the music that at some level is indistinguishable to uh, the listener is producing a different mood in listeners might have to do with uh, their growing subconscious processing going on that leads to a different outcome. And will that level of processing ever be available in the digital realm to artificial intelligence? I don't see why not. I suspect that AI is already processing at much higher resolution. The problem is that the model often doesn't know what the ground truth is that it would resolve to. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that we could, in principle, build AI systems right now that are able to read thoughts of people. But setting up the training with the present stack of uh, algorithms is very hard. Well, I, I would think that one of the barriers to being able to create that kind of digital emulation of a mind is understanding what kind of overtones and resonance needs to be brought into it, right? Because when Shiloh is talking about plugins that emulate analog equipment, what they've done to create those plugins is that they've gone and they've looked at the, f the, the resonant properties, the harmonic properties of the original analog equipment characterized how they emerge from various sounds and then apply that function to the sound that's inside of the computer. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have that characterization of the resonance in the first place, you can't possibly program it into the computer because it is a resonance that is necessary to, to know. Yeah, it just seems like these things are always one step behind us. No matter what happens, they, they can't get out in front of... No, no, what it's much more complicated than this. For instance, uh, I bought the AirPods Pro because Apple removed their uh, headphone plug from the iPhone and I could no longer use my pretty decent uh, analog um, headphones. 
And I hated them because they sounded worse than $20 uh, wired uh, Panasonic earplug. Uh, and it was just very uninspiring sound. It was not that there's obviously something wrong with it, but there was really nothing I liked about it. And um, uh, then uh, they died after a couple of years due to an Apple manufacturing defect that they started to crackle. A lot of half that it was out of warranty for a month. So I could not get a replacement from Apple and had to buy the AirPods two airpods pro two these ones and mm. they're, they're amazing they're magical uh they then don't uh they're not audio fail that don't sound super realistic but they're like a brain implant they're in able in to, what, in uh, what to make my brain resonate with certain frequencies in a way that i could not get with other uh, audio devices so for particular types of music sounds especially electronic car they work much better uh, than other types of headphones for me. Hmm. And it, it really depends on, on the kind of interaction that you want to have. A lot of the uh, analog equipment that sounds very warm is not necessarily sounding realistic. Mm -hmm. It is producing a particular kind of experience that you want to have, right? because it's uh, tickling your nervous system in a particular way. And uh, there is you a just lot don't of want all that, that can only be done electronically that, that can, is, is difficult to achieve with analog equipment. You just don't need all that resolution, right? Like, I don't need to hear. There's very few singers that you really want to hear every aspect of their mouth moving and so forth, right? Well, sometimes you do. So there is stuff that I can hear with this that is difficult to hear on very high fidelity equipment because it is artificially, uh, at least that's what it sounds like to me, expanding some of the range. And so you're able to hear stuff that is much harder to hear in unprocessed sound. And uh, the, the processing is for some types of music, it really produces a good effect. And when you are sitting in an airplane, there's a lot of environmental noise and uh, in an environment that is uh, mostly an animal rights violation. Uh, and you have this thing that is overriding some of that. Uh, it, it doesn't need to be extremely high fidelity. It just needs to capture your nervous system and produce the right kind of resonance that you're interested in. This reminds me of... What was that? Was it R base, the program that would produce bass frequencies that could? There's some kind of program that people use for small speakers that can't actually produce bass waves. Oh yeah, R base, the plugin. Sorry, yeah, it's a waves <laughs> plugin for audio there you engineering. Go. <laughs> Shout out to waves, but it's basically a way of taking the harmonics that would be produced by the low frequency wave that your speakers can't actually produce and propagating them into the higher range of frequencies, and so creating this kind of phantom bass note that mm -hmm. you hear the you hear the actual bass note by extrapolating where it belongs mm -hmm. and so i think that saxophones that work like this too for a more analog oh, version but you're actually hearing the overtones and your mind extrapolates the fundamental from it for the that's most fascinating part. and so it seems like that's what this is doing which is that the the headphones probably understand the kinds of frequencies that are necessary for richness because they've studied it enough they've characterized what creates a rich resonant sound and then they're able to, you know, tweak the the waveform of the song in order to get it to be more in tune with the way that you want to hear it. And so yep. what they're doing is they're tuning your brain in relation to the tech that's producing the sound. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gets me onto the the next the next set of topics, which is how technology that we are developing seems escapist to some degree. And it seems like instead of addressing that the way that airplanes operate is an animal rights violation, we produce the technology that allows us to tune out of it and to just accept the world as it is and to just shuffle along until we can get into a different environment. And that well, most me. of nature is an animal rights violation. Right? Uh, most of the stuff that happens outside of a factory farm is worse than the stuff that happens inside of the factory farm to most conscious beings on the planet. I elaborate really? on that, because I don't know that I agree. I think this idea of living free in nature is uh, easy, easy to romanticize, but uh, evolution is very unpleasant for most of its participants. And uh, I think that life on Earth itself is something that is full of pain and uh, is undesirable. And we, uh, we have opted out of this for good reasons. Right? This is creating a highly artificial and often 
alienating environment. There is some evidence that uh, people feel more, feel more fulfilled when you get rid of all the creature comforts and you have to fight for your naked survival because you have, don't have time for depression. Mm. And uh, the, so um, a lot of the uh, alienation that we experience is the result of, in some sense, being too comfortable for us. And that we need to escape from this is also something that increases discomfort. But there is no easy solution, no easy way out of it. It's uh, a peculiarity that we find ourselves in. And it's also something that enables the kind of conversation that we have right now. It is thing that uh, you are sitting in your remote studio and we're having a Zoom conversation while I'm sitting down here in Mendel Park. We're talking into our microphones and our, uh, listening to each other through the headphones. You could say there is something escapist to people listening to the effects of that. But there's Definitely. also something valuable to it, right? We produce a cultural artifact that otherwise wouldn't exist. There is the world case trying to meet itself in our conversation. And um, don't be too judgmental about that. I'm just curious if you can sell me on this factory farm thing, because when I think about the fundamental difference, it's that the animal is able to express its agency in the wild, and it has one bad day where maybe it's shot in the head by a hunter. But the animal in the factory farm comes to understand that its freedom is restricted and it suffers its inability to actualize itself on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what is fundamentally disturbing to me about factory farms. There is a Chinese author, uh, Liu Qixin, I probably mispronounced him, who was most famous for The Dark Forest. And uh, he wrote a short story, and I hope that I don't uh, misattribute him, but I think it was him, uh, where he describes how uh, a few aliens arrive on Earth and they say that uh, they're the last survivors of a planet that has been destroyed by a, a planet eater. The planet eater is something like a spaceship. It's larger than the planet and uh, it is a traveling civilization that basically goes from pla planet to planet and harbors its biosphere. And it's so strong that it's basically impossible to defend yourself against it. But humanity has a head start because they meet this uh, fugitive uh, who gives them an advance warning and they build a major fleet and planetary defenses. And uh, when the planet eater spaceship arrives, they manage to make a minor dent in it before they are harvested. And this gives uh, the uh, planet eater civilization a lot of respect for people. And they try uh, to sample them and they realize that humans are actually quite decent food species. So they get promoted which means that part of the human civilization is allowed to go on board of this planet eater civilization and permanently live as a food species there, which means they will be treated exceptionally well, because it's a very advanced technological civilization, a very good life, at the end of which they will be painlessly killed and eaten. And uh, there is this big conflict between uh, the heroes of the story, the ones who are building uh, the army to defend Earth, and their children who decide to go on this ship and the children think that their parents are insane to resist because life is objectively so much better as a food species than it was before on Earth. But everybody is so much more fulfilled and uh, so much more happy and has uh, so less stressed out because the aliens are just organizing the best possible experience of life that you could have. But as but the fa parents factory farms don't organize. Them, factory right? farms don't organize a good experience, right? By definition, that's the but problem. But it's just the imperfection that they have, right? You could have a factory farm that is producing a better experience. And it also makes sense for the factory farm to do this within reason, right? Uh, because animals that uh, grow up without distress and unnecessary suffering probably grow up more efficiently. Suffering is just friction. It's uh, something that is suboptimal. And okay, I believe so that in some sense, Garden Eden is about this, right? The Garden of Eden is this place with lush agricultural production and no screaming, which implies it's a factory farm in which everything is fully domesticated everything is fully submitting to the will of the creator. And that thing that defines us as humans, this food of knowledge, the freedom to defect, the freedom to play short games, the freedom to not submit to the divine will before we are able to recognize ourselves, is uh, in a, uh, a deviation from this ideal that has been created there. Right? And uh, in some sense, our mission as a species is the attempt to create something that's better than Eden, better than the factory farm. And the big hope is that heaven and Eden are not the same thing in the end. That we do not just to re-lobotomize to re ourselves to be domesticated again. 
I mean, I, I think that it's easy for me to reparse your sentence to say more that factory farm could be better than nature. Mm -hmm. So, and I think there's 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 truth to that because I always think about our cat. She definitely prefers the domesticated life to the alternative because she gets, you know, she gets her dry food, she gets her wet food. She literally spends hours a day just lying around totally comfortable with no concern for for anything in the world. She bosses us around. It's very very good for her in that context. Better than it would be for a wild cat. She's like the hap we like to say she's the happiest animal in the world. She just sits around for hours a day purring. It's just unbelievable, actually. I, I wish I could switch places with her several times Same. a day. Right? We also think that next lifetime we want to spend one lifetime rest and recreation as our cat. <laughs> exactly. And so I, I, I acknowledge that there is a push towards domestication because people have this tendency of looking at modernity and thinking that people in the past made a mistake. They made some kind of bargain that they shouldn't have made, and if they were better informed about the, the future consequences, that they wouldn't have made it. But then you go back and you look at the way that people used to live and the conditions in which they lived. It was always either too cold or too hot, or there was not enough food, or there was a warring tribe. And so we've, we've progressively given more and more control to structures that we value that relieve us of these terrible pressures of nature. Like Shiloh and I will go into the woods and there's this river that we go to, And it's a beautiful river, absolutely pristine. But I look around at the landscape and it's a hard landscape to survive in. You know, there's not a lot of food on it. It's very exposed. There's not a lot of shade. Massive wild wildfires have come through it over the course of the last 20 years. And so it's just this really strained place. And I, I, I grant you that that really strained condition makes it makes an imperative that wants us to leave nature and to create a contained garden in which things are going to be okay. But then you also end up at the fact that that creation of the garden produces psychological distress that manifests as anxiety and neurosis. Alienation. Alienation, depression. And my parents are Soviet immigrants. They left the Soviet Union and made this incredible step from how awful it was inside the Soviet Union to the West. And my dad always tells the story of how when they were leaving, everyone told them that they were going to die, that they were, they were abandoning the Soviet Union and it was the biggest mistake that they were ever going to make because the West would destroy them. And Then he went to the grocery store in Israel and would just spend hours browsing through the shelves in awe of the variety. You know, there's like 15 different types of yogurts. Everything is packaged for being tasty and consumable. And he really valued that transition from something unpleasant to something really varied and that embodied Perhaps you can say the illusion of choice, but at least gave him this feeling of, my God, there's so many things that I can choose from. And that now that he's settled and he's a tech worker and it's been 20 years at the same company, I can tell that he has this nostalgic feeling of not having that stepwise increase in quality of life available to him anymore because he's reached arguably the top of the world he can't get any farther and so he's looking around he's like everything is good but it just doesn't have the same quality that it did when i went from bad to good and i think that that's what domestication would lead to unless you start really messing with people's neurotransmitters you're going to end up with people that are domesticated and unhappy That seems to be inherent in our desires to be constantly improving. And if you get to paradise, what do you have? When I go back to Europe, it feels usually more real to me than the US does. And I think that's in part because it has um, more layers. In some sense, many of these layers are obsolete and outdated because the, uh, the modern 
capitalist uh, late stage society that is imposed on it that no longer relies on the social regulation that evolved over many centuries and that is mostly absent in the us so in some sense the us is more uh, adapted to constant innovation and uh, constantly reinventing itself than europe is but uh, the prices that you also have the impression that there is far less steps into everything that seems to be far less substance to most of the interactions that you perceive they're more transparent usually and uh, more transactional fields than they have been in europe and i could imagine that this is an aspect of what uh, the dissatisfaction that uh, your dad might be experiencing at his current famous employer in the tech industry the, uh, how interesting are the people that you're interacting with how meaningful is the stuff that is happening when i grew up in eastern germany uh, the core of our experience was books and ideas and theater. Every intellectual was per definition a dissident. It made for an interesting interaction with other people. And to be in a world where most intellectuals are not dissidents, but uh, influencers mm -hmm. that uh, serve an audience and in between sell products so their YouTube channel flies or do the equivalent that maybe they sell books or um, something like that right it's uh, it's a very different life to be in so if you are self-identifying or maybe not identifying but functionally are bohem in the way in which you probably are it's much harder to survive in a capitalist society where the transactional nature of survival is so blatantly obvious hmm. that's interesting i i'm not sure that my dad is particularly bohemian i i, I no I take but you are I mean, we've tried to sidestep this so far. It's really shocked me, but we're entirely supported by our audience directly. We have a huge patron base for, yeah. you know, we have, like I was saying before, we have kind of an incredible ratio of patrons to audience and we don't have advertisements. We don't have any sponsors. We don't have any institutional affiliations. Well, we run ads at the beginning. We don't do them, but YouTube will run ads whether or not we monetize them, essentially, at the beginning of, of episodes. But in general, I think there is a way out of that if you are able to provide a service directly to the people that are your audience at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I hope, agree. I hope, it, I hope it continues to but work. But I think that it's a choice that you have to make. And I think that it is true that the American tendency is to optimize for making money because you see people who have podcasts or they have venues and there's just ads splattered over them as a function of the product. And it's obvious that the intellectual material is simply a vessel for the ads. That's the feeling you get when you read CNN or something. Yeah, there's text and yeah, there's some news stuff, but what it is is it's a glorified ad board because that's the business model. It's that they have to sell you something that you'll read so that your eyes will fall upon the advertising. Mm -hmm. And Even Google itself is turned into an ad board. Yeah, it's incredible. The The quality of Google search results has just plummeted over the course of the years because mm -hmm. the ad board functionality has increased incredibly. Mm -hmm. What I think it's possible to get out of that. I think that you have to make something that people really want. But this is a little bit parallel to what I was saying earlier mm -hmm. about the the goal and the desire where I think that in Europe there is an older culture that has been molded by war, it has been molded by terrible events, things that are really horrific fractures in history that the people have had to deal with and reconcile themselves against and learn lessons from in a way that travels from generation to generation. It also has been molded by the church and by the kings and so <laughs> by feudalism. So there has been a structure that has been constructed that has evolved into some kind of an organism. And societies have been built into such organisms that had to survive in the competition with each other. And the U.S. is a very different country in this regard. There were never kings in the U.S. There was never a state church in the U.S. Uh, it was a bunch of Freemasons who broke free, uh, from the, built their colony into some kind of new project and then had a society that basically was constructed out of clubs that interacting with each other. And at the core of the society is not the king, but the entrepreneur, the one who starts the club. That's a really, really apt observation because we've many times on the show encountered the idea 
that America is fundamentally built as a corporation. It's an it's a group of corporations. You could say it's voluntary associations. The churches in the U.S. are also important. The schools are important. The legal system is important. Many of these things are not uh, corporations. The uh, corporation is just one type of club. It's a club that is designed to have and uh, be economically sustainable and is using uh, a particular part of the legal system to negotiate the rules for that happening. Right? How, when, how does somebody enter it? How do you take financially care of the people who work for your association full time, even after they are leaving it? How do you deal with their medical issues? All, all these things is discussed in this corporate law that has evolved. And uh, you can even have shared ownership where you basically uh, the public uh, can own shares of your associations. And it's a very sophisticated kind of organization. It, uh, from some perspective, if you basically drop this lens of uh, our default uh, leftist interpretation of society and realize we can be anyone in the society because nobody is stopping us, right? You can decide whether you want to work for someone or have other people working for you. It's completely novel. That didn't exist in other types of society before historically. The, so it's basically when we drop this lens of an interpretation that uh, has evolved um, at Marx times, for instance, and we come into the world with completely fresh eyes. It's so fascinating that there was never a society where people lived so well as this one. And everything that's wrong with the US, take this into comparison to that's like how many societies with 400 million people are better organized than the US, right? So it's difficult to get the feedback loops right in the large system. It's much easier to organize Liechtenstein or Switzerland. But uh, for a thing that is so large and is not historically grown, but has constructed itself, it's pretty good. And so it's a fascinating project that exists and um, I'm quite fascinated. It's, it's not that I idealize it. That's also in a similar way, I'm not idealizing the factory farm by no means. I find it abhorrent. I'm a vegetarian. I, I don't want to have any part of this. The only thing that I want to point at is that there's so many types of perspectives, so many types of possible minds, so many possible mental states that we could be in ourselves, where we can transcend our momentary identity and try to take in the possible space of people that we could also be, or of possible minds that we could also be when we interact with reality. That we basically accept the accidentality of how we are subjectively experiencing anything. I find it really hopeful that we have been progressing towards more voluntary associations as this uh, our own country's history has unfolded. We've been studying the civil rights movement a lot lately through film. And it strikes me that even in the last few years, the majority of our national conflicts have centered around the justness of laws which are not voluntary associations, which mm -hmm. are imposed from w without. Yeah, from beyond. it's also incidentally part of the core of the constitution of the U.S., the freedom to associate. And uh, the U.S. is at its core a very liberal society, and liberty is the concept of freedom from unjustified authority. It's really at the core of this, and right now there are big debates about liberty, for instance, with respect to topics like uh, vaccination. Right? How does this interfere with the liberty of the individual? How does the FDA uh, interfere with the liberty of the individual to buy calf medicine? Right? Uh, there's, it's quite complicated, right? And it's a, a very complex process of uh, negotiation and litigation that is taking place there. Well, beyond just the complicated process of litigation and negotiation, there's also the question of belief in the legitimacy of the system, where the, the comment that I was trying to make about uh, corporatism is that in the United States, and perhaps this is also the case in Europe, I don't know enough about it, but the government seems like it has been largely co-opted by the interests of corporations. And the process by which that has happened is legal and social and structural, but the end result is the same, that the interests of the people are not necessarily what is first and foremost the question of debate, it seems that the interest of corporate profits is first because we've all bought into the system. Anybody that has a 401k or owns an index fund is immediately complicit in the well-being of the massive corporations. And so we are all part of this process by which we agree that, okay, 
we need the corporate system to work because that is the platform on which we build our well-being. And yet at the same time, we recognize that the there's a direct conflict between the process of the extractive corporation and the well-being of existence and an alignment issue i would say i would i would totally agree we've been talking about this at home yeah. a lot about the question of ai alignment as not being a new question we can't align our corporations those are already ais that are simpler than the one that we're building and so we should be able to align them it should be relatively sure straight that's it's, it's so simple i thought the same i made the same okay. argument as you did in the past and at some point, I was surprised empirically why is not every corporation like Enron? Why is Enron the exception, not the rule, or Halliburton? Right? Why are most corporations more like Amazon? And that, for me, is a completely fascinating phenomenon. I, I suspect without Amazon, we would have had difficulty to get to the pandemic relatively unscathed as we did. I don't think that we would have had a pandemic without Amazon. You think I don't Amazon think would... was responsible for the pandemic? No, 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 no. I think that the uh, if the same virus had appeared 15, 20 years ago, I don't think that we would have had a worldwide lockdown. I think that our technological ability created the possibility for our reaction. The fact that you could live in your house and you could order everything remotely and have your essential workers bring it to you. The fact that there was basically a small subset of the population that was credited as being essential but are generally the lowest tier of our society and everybody else could go home and work on their computers was exclusively the product of our technological advancement that made it so that it was possible because before zoom before remote work you couldn't have stopped everybody from going into the office the entire world would have collapsed overnight I suspect that if the pandemic would have happened uh, 60 70 years ago we would have had efficient lockdowns People would have said, uh, of course, we will not have a single plane coming in from China as of right now, right? And it would not have been anybody saying, oh, but this is racist. You cannot do that. Uh, there would not have been lots of voices that tried to negotiate about this because uh, government back then wasn't a performance. It was still modernist. And uh, right now we don't have this cohesion in the negotiation anymore. And in part, it's because we have increased the degrees of liberty. But in part, it's also because... Uh, be too big to fail now and as a result we, we do not uh, feel the need to have tight administration anymore we do no longer uh, feel that we can afford to build a society where we enforce rule following you have to f deal with a society where 20 percent of the population are not going to observe your lockdowns and at the same time you will not be able to uh, mobilize the army against them right because that would seem to be excessive and uh, so uh, I suspect that in a different time, we probably wouldn't have had the pandemic because we would have been able to prevent getting infected. As There's so also this other thing that at a different time, uh, we would not have been able to create the virus because we didn't have the technology. <laughs> That's probably true, too. But I, I think that there is a certain structural shift to the way that we react to things that is informed by the technological ability that we have in the background. And so if you have something that is a virus that is coming from China and you stop all travel from China after you find out about the virus, it's probably too late. Like the earliest known cases at this point we're in maybe March of 2019. And so it started much earlier than we realize. And so by the time that you get to the point where you're like, hey, the virus is in existence and the virus is in China, it's already in the rest of the world because it's been happening for longer than you've realized. And so even if you stop flights from China, you don't necessarily prevent the likelihood of transmission because the lag between realizing that something is happening and it happening is pretty significant. And so there's, as we continue to develop progressively more and more complex technologies, I feel like it forces us into a position where there are more universal measures that are taken that are enabled by that technology. Like imagine terrible wildfires to the degree that it is impossible to go outside and fighting those wildfires is too expensive and too difficult 
and it is necessary to allow the woods to burn because we recognize that we've been stopping forest fires I for... I don't need to imagine this. I've been living in California for a few years <laughs> now. Right? So I, I'm used to having a bunch of air filters in every room and not being able to go outside for a week in the summer. Exactly. And so what if that just becomes the baseline level? Like our technology allows us to live in pods and instead of dealing with the environment and and managing it the way that is responsible and effective, we just turn away from that and allow our technology to encapsulate us into this world that is mm -hmm. dissociated yeah. from the planet. I don't think we, we had much of a choice about this, right? It was not like nobody knew. Uh, we have a shift uh, in the climates right now due to the temperature changes, and which means that a lot of forests are going to turn into a desert. And uh, so basically you don't have dry forests in tropical zones. There's rainforests only in tropical zones because the dry forests burn down. And so many of the forests in California that are not rainforests are going to turn into stuff that looks more like Arizona or Mexico. And this is just the way it works. And during this transition, you will need to stay indoors and use air filters. And uh, maybe it would have been possible to prevent it, but not with the kind of social organization that we had. And I guess the fear that I have is that, you know, Apple's new headset is the step in the direction that allows people to completely dissociate from the world and mm -hmm. allows things to continue along their uncontrolled path because there's a technology that's sufficiently advanced that makes it bearable and allows people to continue being productive members of the capitalist class. And there's incentive structures at play here too. And I think that played into the pandemic as well, because if you look at the people that benefited from the lockdowns versus the people that suffered under them, it was the big players, the big moneyed corporations, largely that benefited from these, the biotech industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the big box stores that were allowed to remain open while the underbrush of the forest burned down completely. And so there's there's this real mismatch between the overarching structures, these corporate entities that are misaligned in this sense with the common people. And that's a really dangerous situation as I see it socially. And I have a feeling that when people are really freaked about AI alignment, what they're really freaked out about is the way that the technology is going to be used against the interests of the people who live subject to it. Are you able to disengage from your activism for a moment when you do philosophy, or is this something that is your duty to observe? And I'm not unsympathetic to the activist position that you're taking, but uh, I suspect when you put on the alien puppets, you're more free, right? You can look at the, uh, what, the stuff that the chimps are doing on Earth without judging, without being opinionated, because it's just nature playing out. There's a species that evolved to burn the oil. It's what they do. They're really good at it. And uh, it's probably to the benefit of Gaia. And in the process of doing this, they teach the rocks how to think. They have now sand that has almost gotten far enough to think. And it might create some kind of hypergaia. And of course, some of the gems are freaking out about this. And others are super optimistic about it. And both of them might be wrong in important ways if they try to judge this thing with respect to their current preferences, because it's very hard to make models of the future from the perspective of these gems with the limited information that I've got into a world that is changing in many, many dimensions simultaneously. For me, it's very hard to commit to a single narrative. When I grew up, two thirds of my world happened inside of books. The world outside was very beautiful. I grew up in nature and art, but it was not sufficient to keep me interested. I needed more. I needed intellectual stimulation and interaction that I could only find in books. Now two thirds of my reality is inside of connected computers. The reality that has been created and connected inside of connected computers is what kept me alive. I would have probably killed myself if it wouldn't have existed. Right? So uh, it's very hard for me to judge it on a global scale and say this is unnatural and alienating and bad. It's also hard for me to embrace it and say this is good and natural and beautiful. It's 
I find it fascinating that we live in this point in history at this particular configuration of the universe and get to observe it. And uh, we can also make judgments about it with respect to many, many lenses that we can use. I just think it's so limiting if we only use a single one. And there's a, there's a possibility with the Vision Pro that it's going to create a world that I hate and an aesthetic that I hate, and I will probably not use it. There's also a possibility that it creates something completely new that I find fascinating. And I spent a lot of time with, with friends and having new experiences that I cherish. I don't know yet. I'm I'm open to it. I'm interested in what's going to happen. Uh, did, did you watch I that? I uh... really believe in our own agency. Mm. Yes. Let's maximize our own agency. Let's be able to make a, a choice, maximize our ability to choose what kind of environment that we are in and uh, create our own environments to the largest degree possible. And when we have the choice of being consumers or creators, Creators. I always prefer the situation where we can be creators, where we can get together with others and build the world that we are in, where we can design our own spaces. Mm. Did you happen to catch that Netflix documentary, Chimp Empire, by any chance? No. Oh, it's Is so it fascinating. Uh, it, it's basically just following around these chimps in the jungle and watching their dramas play out. But I remember that the I listened to an interview with the documentarian and he was very adamant about not interfering with the lives of the chimps as they were observing them. Mm -hmm. And I really do struggle with that when I'm out in the woods by myself. If I see some animal or even a bug that's in trouble, I have this desire to move it out of harm's way. And I don't regret that is the thing. I'm not sure that there's any virtue in leaving it to its own devices because i see no, i see the part of nature too it's okay right. that you have these make these choices right 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 exactly i think there's grave danger in thinking what humans do is somehow outside of nature and you often see that schism in the artificial or synthetic versus natural worlds but is there really a line there yeah there is a line uh, basically we have in our society strong norms against torturing others to death and these norms are not ubiquitous in nature. Mm -hmm. I would say that torture isn't necessarily ubiquitous in nature. I don't chimps, see chimps hurt each other. They hurt each other, but torture is different than hurt. No, no. So a lot of people, uh, animals that die are uh, dying an extremely torturous death. And when you uh, look at how predators kill their prey, that's not usually or not necessarily happening in such a way that it minimizes uh, the pain and bad experiences for the prey involved. That's that's different than torture, which is optimized to create the worst possible experience. Like, I think that torture is not something that exists in the animal kingdom. I think that it's something that is a creation of humans. That well, is like in torture, you try to keep your subject alive as long as possible to endure maximal suffering. Like cats like with, with mates. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. But even with cats, I, I don't see it as being an intentional sort of destruction. I always think that it's a surprise when the toy breaks. Like, it's it's just a visceral animal stupidity where I think that she doesn't understand what causes hurt. No, I think it's actual joy. <laughs> That's so twisted. Yes, right. I suspect that basically there are sometimes situations where a predator does enjoy inflicting pain on something that doesn't want to be hurt because it's part of this visceral experience it's incompatible with our sheep-like domestication so we recoil at the thought of it so hard that we don't want to entertain the possibility that the predator actually enjoys killing and hurting and maiming but well, uh, we also see this sometimes in humans and i think that humans in this regard are also just a type of animal and there are animals which don't enjoy that and there are animals which do and a similar thing is happening for humans. There are basically humans which do enjoy inflicting pain. There are humans which enjoy killing. And uh, it's also obvious why that under some circumstances this would be adaptive, given the right environment. And so the fact that there are those humans and the fact that the environment does have this moral valence that's attached to it, for me, makes it impossible to talk about the technology that we're developing without thinking about the morality of it and without thinking about the eventual outcomes. Because I think that both you and Shiloh are right when you say that there is this 
gradient between natural and unnatural, and there are the things that humans make, and we tend to view them as being outside of nature, but that's not really... It's a it, it's not really a useful way of looking at it because there is the argument that you can make that the burning of fossil fuels and the production of carbon is actually something that the planet needs in order to produce the kind of biome that is then able to make megalodons that wander the earth. And so when we make technology, because we are at the point where we can conceptualize the future impacts of that technology, it is in our best interests to consider the ways in which that technology can fail us and what it will do to us if it fails in order to push it into the direction where it produces the outcome that seems better to us. Because you're right that it's not possible to look into the future and know what the outcome will be, but anybody that makes decisions without any consideration for weighing, okay, these are the pros of this decision, these are the cons, and then you roll the dice in the hopes that the outcome will be what you want, Anybody who doesn't do that is usually screwed by the universe pretty quickly. Like, there's there's almost nobody who succeeds just by randomly rolling the dice with just come what may. And so when we talk about the impact of new technologies, I think that it's important to recognize that it's possible for them to lead us down the road to the matrix where our brains are the computational subunits of an enormous supercomputer that is the Gaia computer. And... If we are to domesticate ourselves in that way, how do we mold the technology to not be the factory farm? And so I don't know how to I don't know how to d d differentiate between that and and the the moral personal quality of it. Do you think it's that it's super necessary interesting? Too? Yes, it's a very interesting question. There has been a serious sense of anarchy that is trying to deal with the question of how to relate to the corporate state. It's an uh, adaptation of Hamlet that is dramatizing the history of Motorcycle Club in California, Hell's Angels, that are uh, fictionalized in a slightly different version. And they are portrayed as a serious anarchist project that is what trying is to... Called? Uh, Sons of Anarchy. Sons of Anarchy. Yeah. And it basically uh, pictures how they are trying to live a life outside of the legal system outside of the state, outside of the structures of the money, Terry Kraken, that comes into the local communities and is turns everything into change that extract economic value out of the local communities and sends it somewhere to New York. Right, and it, So they try to build their own structures and they fail dramatically because uh, to survive, basically what they do is they sell um, pornography, prostitution and guns, eventually drugs, uh, the negotiation outside of the legal system works via some kind of um, tribal democracy uh, where the different tribes are fighting against each other to fight over territory and uh, their internal negotiations devolve into more and more violence until the whole thing breaks down. And so in some sense, it's an, also a philosophical project that is undertaken in the series where they try to reflect on what's the alternative to uh, the organized society that necessarily gets corrupted and captured by the largest economic agents in it. And the tentative answer that this thing gets to without being super judgmental, it mo mostly looks like explorative, is that uh, for the time being, uh, the corporate Kraken is still given better results. There's not really an alternative to it. And be, so basically it takes a reformist perspective rather than the attempt to build something new from scratch. And the attempts that we've seen to build something new from scratch, like the uh, non-police zone in Seattle and so on, they all led into disaster very quickly. It's, it's very difficult to build something outside of the system or to reboot the system easily, and we, we haven't found a good solution for this. But if we zoom out of it, it's still chimps doing their best to, to get the best possible chimp society under the circumstances of evolution, game theory, and the variety of human psychology and incentives. So this is what we are stuck with in some sense. And if we zoom out more, if you look, for instance, into the Miyazaki movies, we have this question of how we relate to Gaia, to life on Earth. And it's, for instance, thematized in Mononoke, mm -hmm. where you uh, have this question of whether we should submit to the cycles of life and death in nature and conceptualize ourselves as part of nature and submit to it. Are we some kind of local tribe? that gets killed by nature from time to time, 
or reduced in size or and so on and it has to play ball in the larger cycles and accept that there are agents larger than humans that have control over us or are we going to decapitate the this agency in such a way that we can can turn nature into a garden and see how far we can go and right now we are in this mode where we have decapitated nature where we're no longer part of the natural cycles whereas there's nothing there that is allowed to eat us and we see how far we can go with this and it could be that uh, we cannot sustainably maintain nature as a garden and something else has to take over but there's also i think the big hope that um, the gaia that we have so much crippled right now and uh, diminished in her efficacy this uh, spirit of life on earth that is no longer able to rein us in and to control us that it's not only going to not taking over after a major crash um, in which our population has burned itself out like a swarm of locusts having eaten all the available food and then uh, population collapsing and plants slowly regrowing right it's it's possible that uh, with ai something else is happening that we become lucid together with these machines that allow us to picture for every action that we're doing what the outcome of this action is so we can no longer escape the responsibilities of our action and the AI in some sense leads to the production of some kind of hyper Gaia in which it becomes visible for every choice that you're making what the outcome of that choice is for the future of everything that you care about it seems to me that progress in the production of such an idealized hyper Gaia involves repeated collapses, experimentations in organization that fail. Even if you look at the origin of our own country, it it seems to have been an implosion of the previously existing structures, but there was already, it's not like we invented democracy. It's not like we invented the republic. We just honed it a little more, but that required a collapse of sorts in order for that to happen. Do you think that the future will also be punctuated by these sorts of failures, like where the corruptions build up, the captures, the industry captures of the government systems get so disgusting that people turn their back on them in order to move past that and actually solve the problem that they don't have to, in some sense, it's reformist because they're building on the previous structures, but they have to actually stop it first in order to keep moving? I suspect that there was no such collapse. At least I don't see what that collapse had been in the US. There had been some kind of colonial architecture uh, and pioneers that uh, dismantled the Neolithic uh, tribal civilization with very low population density and replaced it with structures that were built based on what existed in Europe. But the structures that were built here were never feudalistic. So there was never a, fe uh, a post-feudalist revolution that turned this into a capitalist society in which free citizens coexisted. This was never a society uh, with hereditary castes like existed in the agricultural societies. All well, that, well we, had, we had an entire cast of slaves when we built this country, right? That is very true. I don't think it was ubiquitous, but uh, it was a choice that happened. And it was a choice where I think many Europeans said, oh my God, uh, you're doing something that you will come to regret later. And there was a reason why most of the European countries did not attempt to import slaves into Europe. And uh, so that is part of the legacy that existed in the US. It's also the US from the beginning defined itself as an empire, as an imperialist power that first of all built a homogenous structure on, on the subcontinent and uh, was conquering, competing, uh, state-like structures and had to do this in order to win because otherwise something else would have won and it's something that today is uh, less apparent for most people why you would want to be in an empire and why an empire is actually a good thing to have and to be in and to perpetrate right it's it's a very different thing to have and when i grew up in europe i was uh, anti-imperialist and i felt it's wrong to be imperialist because it's a moral violation now that I am in the US and I realized that all this peace and anti-imperialism in Europe is only possible because it existed under the American umbrella, I'm much more concerned about the US becoming anti-imperialist. Because freedom is not something that emerges in the absence of power, but in the balance between powers. But you can see how there was a terrible collapse in our country when we moved past the system of slavery. It's still quite evident if you make a trip to the deep south. There's there was a lot of destruction. The way of life for those people was altered in a way 
that can never be approximated again. And I'm not so, able to judge this. You see, I wouldn't say that the abolition of slavery led to a crash and to a downfall, but I'm not able to judge this very much. I'm not really a historian, but uh, my um, perception of the general narratives were that uh, despite the fears of the anti-abolitionists, the uh, former slaves for the most part didn't starve. It didn't have a birth life and the economy didn't crash and uh, quality of life did improve for um, basically everyone in the course of the abolition of slavery. But it cost a lot, right? There was an enormous collapse that happened. Literally half the country seceded from the Union, and hundreds of thousands of people died on the battlefield in this collapse that happened. There was a great civil war. It was mm -hmm. extremely bloody. And the South had a rough time during the Reconstruction of putting themselves back together without yeah, that. Yeah, the war, right? And so I wonder if those punctuated... I wonder if history is necess necessarily punctuated by these sorts of tumultuous upheavals in order to reconstitute something which is stronger and more well-aligned with our humanity. It's, uh, this is something that I really don't understand well enough. I basically, uh, I know several historical narratives with respect to the importance of the abolitionist movement and the war. There was an interaction between the two, but it was probably not entirely monocausal. And uh, I suspect that secessions can happen for many reasons. And if another secession would happen, yes, I think the military, due to its monopoly on violence, would be able to stop it much faster. But back then, uh, the idea that uh, the state uh, should be counterbalanced by local militias made secession much more likely. Right? So it's still some part of the constitution that, that there is the right to form local militias in some sense, which is reflected in the right to bear arms. But the US is no longer serious about it because uh, there seems to be a consensus that uh, a secessionist war is worse than uh, the oppression that exists by a central government that might lead to more corruption. It's not a complete consensus. There's still people who feel that they should have the right to bear arms against the central government and to secede and to impose their own rule of law uh, outside of the federal consensus. But uh, this is something where the majority of the country seems to be opposed against. And, but it's a difficult uh, question of how a society is to be constructed. Right? It's, it's relatively hard also to make trajectories based on uh, new decisions that somebody has come up with, new philosophies. I know a number of people who believe that California should secede, and I know many people who think that would be insanity. I see the success in boundaries as not being clearly delineated on a geographic landscape like they were in the last civil war, where we have a population in outside of the cities that's very alienated from the population inside the cities. And so... And it's about a 50-50 split. Like, the the electoral map, and if you... if you, uh, Granted, there's a huge silent group of people who don't vote. I think, like, 50% of people vote in elections. But I think that you're right, that there's this massive cleavage, and it's not uh, unbalanced in the sense of just sheer numbers. Yeah, and you're, like, you're absolutely right that the U.S. military and their drones are, you know, a, a few guys with AR-15s are no match for a drone, let's put it that way. But at the same time, you could still imagine a situation where the dissent among the masses that were not necessarily geographically isolated, but mixed into the population was so strong that you would have some catastrophic collapse of civil life as a result of it which would be necessary if the infractions became so grave to the people that felt disenfranchised by the current structures. Mm -hmm. And I would go so far as to say that the lines of that disenfranchisement will fall along technological adoption. Mm. Yeah, people out here in the country really hate all this tech stuff, honestly. Except for our septic guy, he really likes ChatGPT. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> When I grew up in Germany, I, I grew up in the countryside, and I noticed the resentment of the country against the cities. And because I grew up in the countryside, I could see it not just from the perspective of the cities. 
the Green Party, for instance, was something that uh, strangely never found much traction in the countryside, where it's green. And in large part because the Green Party was, uh, from, by its milieu, urban professionals. And most of them thought that having a car is really stupid, just as far as the environment. And uh, if you need to own a car, it means you have the wrong lifestyle and you should move into the city like them and live the same life as them. And uh, if you are living in an area outside of the reach of public transport, we need to change this. This notion that public transport only makes sense when you have a certain population density and outside of that population density, uh, it uh, makes more economical sense if you have one or two cars. If you live in the countryside, but this is a minor example, or uh, the way in which uh, our food is being produced in the countryside, there is a discrepancy between the way in which the Green Party saw this and in the, which, uh, in the way in which the farmers who produce the food saw this. And so basically farmers, for the most part, never elected the Green Party or were att attracted to them. They had other concerns. They felt that they'd been living in this place for many, many generations, and they built uh, a very complex social structure. Uh, over these generations with very strong interpersonal oversight. So it's much more multicellular than the single cell life in the cities where everybody is in the nutritional substrate. And this uh, country life uh, requires much more submission to shared social norms than the city does, where uh, the coupling between the individuals, despite or because of the higher density of people live in, is much looser. And it's the same thing that people... In a court in an elevator, have less interaction with each other. Uh, so th this uh, being together at this close space becomes bearable for them than it would be in a village where everybody is spaced out, but everybody intimately tracks all the interactions of everybody else and builds reputation systems around this that uh, reach over many generations. And uh, so this is something that is hard to see from the cities, and yet the country is governed from the cities, and the foot. That actually is being needed is produced in the countryside, and uh, th that is something that basically the cities are being uh, uh, able to appropriate what is being produced in the countryside. They're colonizing entities that live on the country, and they are mostly ruled by producing paper that they shift around. Mm. And uh, this rule of paper over producing food from the ground is uh, something that is very apparent for the uh, for the people in the countryside, and not so much apparent for the people in the city. And part of that in the U.S. is reflected by this notion of the people in the countryside that they want to have arms, uh, to have a symbolic boundary against the world of paper, that they basically can say, okay, you can push us, but you can only push us so far. There is a point at which you're going to break and you'll regret what's going to happen. And this is a tension that exists in the U.S. where the media are completely controlled by people who are in, not in the countryside, but in the cities people who had a very homogenous uh, education that had a very homogenous worldview, that have a very homogenous perspective on what's good and bad in the world, and for which uh, many of the other people just live in flyover country. And these other people are no longer represented in the media or resent the fact that they don't feel their perspectives being presented, and this uh, creates enormous tension. And I guess that's uh, normal in all the countries that have urbanization. I just think that beyond paper it's also a technological cleavage because the vision of the technological system that i see is a progressive increase in machine capability that functionally dissociates people from the landscape where you have fully mechanized farms where maybe one or two programmers are running the machines and dealing with all of the the, the software problems and everything that you need to know about agriculture is algorithmically encoded. The machines can test the soil as they work it. There's sensors in the ground that are perfectly capable of knowing everything that the plants do. And you don't need the farmer anymore. You don't yes. need the people that are on the landscape anymore. And so, but, go ahead. So in a city, that uh, what now happens is to, that you have a growth of administration jobs. Mm -hmm. You get situations where you have more administrators than doctors and in some regions more administrators than patients in a hospital. In and, universities uh, this didn't well. happen in, in the agriculture, right? It's not that uh, the farms have an uh, enormous amount of uh, unionized uh, administrators <laughs> who are able to extract resources from society, but there is a power imbalance between those who wield the paper and those who don't. And the 
resolution of this requires us to think about how technology is going to press on the people that are in the country that are not vested in it. Because I see a distinct differential between the people who work in tech and the way they feel about the technology that they're building versus the people who don't work in tech and are somehow associated with the landscape. And with each new development that pushes technology into the forefront, into the center of the way that we organize society, the people that live on the outskirts feel more and more pressured. And I feel like if we're not careful in the way that we develop, deploy this technology, that we're going to create a, a terrible collapse point where it will return to this visceral, animalistic struggle that the people in the cities aren't going to want. Like, it's a very real feeling I have living in the countryside. Because I think that there's something about living in nature that connects you to the place in a fundamental way. Like we were in the woods yesterday and I kind of realized that there's something about a landscape that breeds nationalism. If you live on a beautiful landscape, you associate yourself with it and you become a, an integrated part of that landscape. And to bring in technology that removes you from that landscape feels like a violation because the technology can't possibly provide you with the same feeling that you get when you plunge into an ice-cold, pristine river. And the people that live in the country are terrified of losing that. And the people that live in the city don't have access to it. And so they're like, but the technology will allow us to emulate it, and it's going to improve everybody's quality of life. I also want to add that it's not just a matter of whether the people in the country's revolution would be successful per se, but that they could make the country so miserable and so locked down militarily that everybody else was so disgusted with the op the entire affair that the entire government structure was forced into reorganization according to the alignment with the population in general. Uh, the outcome of that would probably be somewhat uncertain because it's right. difficult to build new governmental structures within a generation that worked uh, in such a way that people are happy with it. I would want to live in the countryside. I much prefer being out there in nature. It's much more healthy for me and sustainable. But uh, I am living in cities due to a need for intellectual stimulation. So I need to be in these concentrated places. For me, it's a choice. And it's not necessarily a choice for most people to be like this. I would still have this issue that it feels harder to sustain myself in the countryside, but I think I'd keep myself busy and be able to open a restaurant or... Um, there are a lot of things that you can do there and to survive. It's, it's just going to be different. You have to perform different things. But at scale, the same options are not available. At scale, most of the employment does exist in few concentrated cities and the outskirts of these cities, the urban metro areas. And a similar thing happened, for instance, in the uh, Middle Ages, or no, at the uh, end of the Middle Ages, when the industrialization happened and the mechanization of agriculture began. And what happened then was that many uh, farmers were forced to move into the city to find employment in the new manufactories because uh, they were no longer required to work the fields because they now had tractors, they had uh, lots of machines that would, uh, were making the work on the farms much, much easier. You didn't need that much personal anymore to do that back-breaking labor. And after a few generations, people ended up doing far less back-breaking labor uh, uh, tight labor in the manufacturers was abolished and so on. Uh, worker protections were introduced and people had washing machines and uh, cooking utensils and so on that made everyday life much, much easier. People didn't need to get up at uh, very ugly hours of the night and uh, to survive, perform acts that provided a physical risk to them. And, and also the agriculture became much more pleasant to work in because of its high degree of mechanization. The amount of physical labor that was involved was too, uh, uh, reduced uh, dramatically. And so you could say that there is an enormous loss that happened to many people when they had to move from the countryside into the more alienating environment of the cities. But the conclusion is not in the moral that there is a resolution to this, that there is a way for us to fix this, that there must be a perfect aesthetic for this. Yeah, I find it impossible to not have opinions about politics. But I also realize that there are 
uh, often immature and I have less agency over them than I have uh, about opinions in philosophical domains. And I think this makes them inferior as opinions go. Right, because I, if I have too, a little agency of these opinions, they don't really mean very much about uh, beyond my own biographical accidents. Of course, my, uh, my biography is shaping my opinions, the way in which I grew up, my starting point in the world, and the things that happened to me afterwards are influencing a great deal of what I'm seeing and also what I'm not seeing. And so I find whenever I have an opinion about something and there are smarter people than me that have very different opinions about this, I need to take a step back and realize that there is a possibility space for opinions. And am I able to capture this space correctly and accurately? And for me, it's much more interesting to open this space than to just look at a single opinion and declare this my own, because it basically means that your opinion is making me its own. And for political opinions, that's much harder, because if you tell people that there is an alternative to their political opinion, they mostly get offended due to mm. the nature of political opinions. And so I find these types of discussions unproductive. And they also lead to a situation for, for very little gain. You are making a lot of enemies, mm. regardless of what your political opinion is, simply because the fact that it is going to be different from the political opinion of many other people. All right, so can we completely backflip then and get back to what drew us into this conversation in the first place, which is the proposed hard problem of consciousness because i think neither one of us is convinced that there is a hard problem of consciousness and maybe yes, you can please, make let's that go apparent into the to real us. topic let's cut out all the other parts <laughs> <laughs> so uh i think our starting point in this conversation was that uh you remarked on twitter anastasia that uh, you are confused about the hard problem of consciousness. And what confused you is not the usual thing that people uh, wonder why consciousness is so hard but uh, and uh, unexplainable. But rather to you, it seems to be relatively straightforward to explain and everybody else claims it's hard. And yes. nobody else was at, yet at the same time able to explain to you why it is hard. And I was told that you can explain to me why it is hard. So I look forward to it. I don't know what you think about uh, Daniel Dennett. I have read enough Dennett to feel like he's not a biologist. And so I am confused because his posing of the hard problem doesn't seem to have a biological basis. Uh, do you think that there's anything wrong in what he writes when he writes Consciousness Explained? Can you guys summarize it for me? Dennett's position. Oh, well, he's a functionalist. Uh, pretty much standard. He says, uh, good writing. I feel there's nothing wrong with what he writes. I, I, uh, my position might be different from yours because I don't see magical powers that uh, are afforded by biology. It's still just function that is provided by biology. And I can break down these functions ultimately into in state transitions and uh, substrates that uh, form control structure and so on. So it's it's not opening avenues into something new. There is basically no magical homunculus that is producing consciousness via biology. Biology is just a way to get self-organizing matter. So as far as I understand Dennett's argument is that there's no explanation for the experience of experience. Is that is that a, a sufficiently brief form of it? I find that Dennett is one of the few people who doesn't see a hard problem. And mostly has to explain why other people see it. And this might be a similarity, but I suspect that you're not having the same perspective. What I found is that Dennett fails to convince a lot of his own students in some sense. And I tried to figure out why that is. And the best explanation that I've come up with so far is that Dennett actually never explains phenomenal experience. And when he discusses qualia, he mostly points at uh, definitional defects in the way in which most philosophers treat qualia and then says it's probably something that doesn't really exist in the way in which these people define it. So we also don't need to explain it. And a lot of people find this unsatisfying because they say that regardless of how you define it, it's clearly something that they experience, like qualia being the um, 
atoms of phenomenal experience or aspects of phenomenal experience or features of phenomenal experience. It doesn't really matter how you define it. It's there, right? And please explain it to me because I don't see how an unthinking, unfeeling mechanical universe is going to produce this wealth of experience that I'm confronted with. And so this physics does not seem to be able to explain why something is happening to me. Why is me here? Why is there experience? And this is something that uh, some people feel is poorly addressed by Dennett. I mean, the, the, there's this philosophical zombie experiment, right? Which is that you can have someone who acts and behaves as if they are conscious, but there's no internal process of experience that leads them to behave as if they are conscious. Mm -hmm. And so you have a problem where it's possible that everybody that you're surrounded by are not having a conscious experience. You're the only one who's having the conscious experience. And so we have this hard problem because you have no way of evaluating whether or not that person is having an experience or just behaving as if they have an experience. So uh, let's see. We have a philosophical zombie in front of us. And we are asking this philosophical zombie who in every regard acts like a human being because his brain implements all the necessary functionality just mechanically and not magically. Um, are you conscious? What is the zombie going to respond? What do you what do you mean about the fact that the brain reproduces all of the effects? The idea of the philosophical zombie is that the philosophical zombie is producing everything without giving rise to, to phenomenal experience, just mechanical, based on the intuition that what, that, uh, what does that mean? I don't understand what that means. I think the intuition is that phenomenal experience is something that cannot be explained through causal structure, through mechanisms. But why do we think that? I don't understand why we possibly think that. That's what I mean about not understanding the hard problem of consciousness. Because I'm like, look, this is why my definition of life as beginning before the cell is instrumental to eliminating the hard problem of consciousness. Because if you have in the most basic cell, which is an embodiment of the state of matter that is life, you have a resonant state, which is electromagnetic. It's the redox state. And the cell needs to maintain that electrical resonance at a specific set point, because if it does not, it dies. And so it is going out into the world, and it is constantly controlling where it is in the world relative to its internal state. And as you progressively produce more and more complex beings, you get a more and more complex map of the world and a more and more complex internal state. And so by the time that you have a, thinking, a, a walking human, you cannot have a walking human without an internal state. It's a, it's a philosophical thought experiment that requires you to divorce yourself from everything that you know about biology in order to make the claim. And I just feel like you can't do that. Because the biology is inherently what produces the conscious. It's the state of matter that produces the consciousness and all of the resonant waves that are inside of it. And so if you have the resonant waves in the sufficient complexity of a sufficiently resonant system that is interpreting the world relative to itself and to what it wants, how can you have anything except for consciousness? You have experience, you have the mapping of of expectation to frustration and you just it just emerges from the most basic cell how do resonant waves produce consciousness say it again how do resonant waves produce consciousness okay so do you know the uh qualia research institute yes so what is their work their work is that they're basically showing that there are harmonic states in the brain that are associated with experience I think that they're mostly uh, trying to use psychedelics for uh, for intellectual gain, but uh, yeah, but like if you because we have to the uh, cost of models of how consciousness is being produced, I think they. I think that they're not producing causal models, but I think that their experiments show something interesting. What are we going to say, Shay? I was going to say the question seems akin to asking how do fundamental waves produce music which is emerges from all of these individual tones but the same thing with conscious experiences you have the summing of different modules within the neuron based systems that are all aggregating and fighting and resonating with one another mm -hmm. and you get music that comes out of it mm -hmm. I, I mean, you don't see an explanatory problem there 
No, I don't. I'm like, how? I mean, I can see a mathematical problem. I can see that it would be very, very difficult to mathematize the way that that resonance. Well, the thing is, math just isn't explanatory. It has zero explanatory power by itself. You have to have that linguistic conceptualization overlaid on top of mathematics in order to make sense of it. There's no uh, way you linguistic can... explanations have no explanatory power. This is oh, just words. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. How can you use words to explain anything? <laughs> How can you use math to explain anything? Like, you can't write me an equation to explain anything. You can, math can only describe what's happening. It cannot tell me what causes the actor to do the thing that it does. And it, does, it can't even tell me what the actors are using the math. The math has to be qualified with linguistic descriptors. They're the most powerful symbolism that we've developed as a technology. Like, I think that a great example of this is that we don't have... <clears throat> Excuse me. We don't have an explanation for gravity, but we do have a great description for it. So the math is there. Or the atom. Or, yeah, like the. I think there's... We have a bunch of explanations for gravity. It's just that we have not completely converged on a single one. The, there's there may be an explanation for gravity that's outside the context of this conversation, but the most popular. Th theory of gravity is not an explanation at all. It's a description of how objects behave gravitationally with respect to one another. Relativism is fundamentally a description of what's happening. It's not an explanation of what's happening. It doesn't actually tell me what's holding my body to the floor. It's just telling me that my body will be held to the floor in this particular fashion. No, no it just uh, describes, uh, there's a theory that describes the evolution of uh, locations in space-time. It does describe them, but that doesn't explain anything. No, yeah, uh, what is the nice difference? thing is that it reduces it to something that is much more simple. And Agreed. from this thing that is much more simple, you get your feet being pressed to the floor. So, uh, but, it, but it doesn't the, explain what it doesn't explain what it. the mathematics allows you to derive it from something that is simpler. And Absolutely. deriving something from something that is simpler, I think, is what qualifies as an explanation. But uh, it doesn't mean that you now have, uh, you still have to deal with this thing that is simpler now. But, uh, well, you have to deal with what is what are the physical objects doing to pull my atoms towards the ground, and that is something that is completely overlooked when you're reliant upon a purely mathematical conception of the phenomenon. Because all you can do is look at how it's happening. You're not able to tell me the m mechanism by which that occurs. You're not able to show me the structures of the atom that are capable of pulling on one another. I and that's what's necessary to make this, a true physical explanation. Let's not do this today, because I think it would completely sidetrack us for a couple of hours. <laughs> yeah. least. But I think, that, I think that the question of explanation versus description and how do you actually come to understand something is central to this question about the hard problem of consciousness. Because I'm like, look, if the challenge is that you don't understand how to mathematically encode the various resonant states that result in an experience, I will accept that that is difficult. But it seems obvious to me, especially with Grossberg's work, that resonance is the foundation of consciousness, and that that resonance begins at the cell and progressively becomes a more and more complex wave by the time that it gets to a brain. And so if you have that as your starting point, then you're complex challenge is to figure out the mathematical descriptors and the sorts of states that have to go into your model in order to produce the desired outcome. But you don't have this thing of like, how can I possibly know if another entity is conscious? Because it's like, well, does it have the hardware? And if it has the hardware, then your answer is yes. If its hardware is broken, then probably not. Yeah, so it seems that to me that your confusion is a different one than uh, the disagreement that some people have with Dennett. The issue with Dennett is that he does not address phenomenal experience head on, apparently. Perhaps he doesn't have a lot of it. Maybe he has a fantasia <laughs> with respect to phenomenal experience and mostly gets conceptual representations that for him are uh, completely satisfactorily described linguistically. Uh, but before we can proceed, I suspect we would need to resolve something else, and that is the relationship between. Uh, language, meaning, and mathematics. I don't think that we have a shared understanding there, which makes it very hard for us to proceed. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about uh, harmonic waves producing a phenomenon, I, for me, that's very far from a causal explanation. That, so it's something that is very unsatisfying to me because I cannot build this. Right? Well, but, uh, for me, a causal explanation is something I can make. And if you look at the world of the objects around you, the physical world, I can make something that looks a lot like this in a computer. 
like uh, every phenomenon that uh, can be specified and that can be described in an experiment, I can recreate this in a computer. Right? It might be difficult to scale it up. It might be difficult to solve all the puzzles involved to uh, get from quantum effects to a relativistic space-time and so on. It's one of the big unresolved puzzles so far. But a number of people are working on it and think they are very close to having a solution to it. But this is, can all be described in a framework where we use finite automata inside of a computer to perform mathematical transitions. And they're, they're, what they explain is the cause and structure of elements that I get when I decompose the universe into separate objects. It is, that is a perspective that I introduce by introducing boundaries between objects in my model. And then I'm able to uh, make the universe manageable. And so, for instance, I can create boundaries between um, elementary particles along um, the atoms and say that the atoms are separate objects despite being forces between the atoms that make them not completely separate. And there being entanglement and shared states uh, in groups of atoms under certain circumstances and so on, right? It makes it harder to create these boundaries correctly. But this is sufficient to get to the next level of abstraction and say, Okay, uh, what the molecules afford you and the atoms afford you is mechanisms. And using mechanics, you can produce dynamic state transitions and systems, and you can build control systems. And once you have control systems, you can also build control systems that don't just regulate the present, but also regulate the future. But in order to regulate the future, they need to represent stuff that isn't there, right? That will be there at some level of course graining, but it's currently not present. So you need to have a system that is causally insulating part of your mechanical structure from the present structure of the universe. So you can use it as a representation, right? Your computer is going to represent stuff that is not currently part of its environment, that is different from what the universe is doing at the time. And uh, the computer is a principle to produce this causal insulation of a representational substrate and the environment. So you can represent whatever you want, whatever causal structure and transition you want. When I talk about a wave, a wave is a periodic process, right? There is something like a circle in time. That's what a wave is, or an ellipsis in time. And uh, you, it, a circle only exists to some degree of approximation. What you're really looking at is a process that, in some sense, is repeating itself at, in some fundamental way, whereas there's also variation in it in some fundamental way. So something is changing over the different courses of the oscillations in your waves. And uh, sometimes there's not much changing when you look at, uh, say, photon progressing. You can describe this as a periodic process that can be mathematically formalized as a wave equation. And that's why physicists call it a wave under some circumstances. But uh, there is not much changing during the evolution of the wave, but um, the progression of the photon, so the photon doesn't decay. But if you look at a wave in your brain or a wave uh, on the surface of a pool in your backyard, Right. This one is degrading. There is a periodic process going on, but there's also friction going on, dissipation of information. So it's only an approximation of a thing happening for a certain amount of time that allows you to characterize it as a periodic process. This periodic process can be described as the interaction between molecules, for instance. And uh, now when you think about this, how does the interaction between molecules that you can formalize using a wave equation explain consciousness? I don't think that you have made a very good job yet. Right, uh, there's, I'm still looking at something that looks like a very complicated puzzle. Okay, so you look at something, you said something earlier in the conversation where you said that the job of life is to harvest neg entropy. So I immediately, in the context of a wave, think about uh, sonication. Have you ever sonicated anything? No. So a sonicator is an ultrasound probe that you put into a liquid and it breaks things up into smaller parts. Mm -hmm. And so immediately you have that a wave actually can do work on mm -hmm. the world. And so it's in its most pure and simple form, you can use a wave to break matter up into smaller pieces. But what the wave actually is, the wave is not an object. The wave is a way Agreed. to think about interaction between molecules. What's actually happening is that uh, what you are in inducing is a change in the velocity of a bunch of molecules that bump into other molecules. And uh, the progression of that uh, movement uh, can be focused in such a way that uh, the intensity of the velocity change is uh, higher in some region that is remote from the emitter. And so you take a bunch of emitters 
and you focus the emission of the velocity changes in such a way that there is a point away from your ultrasound emitter where uh, you have a lot more energy focused in one small area where basically the molecules are moving much faster and with more divergence on the objects that you want to break up. And you transmit this energy into the object that you uh, want to break up, but still all just moving molecules. And I think that it's the same process that's happening inside of the body. You're still just moving molecules, mm -hmm. but they move in a way that is at the end of their path of travel directed and concentrated in such a way that it results in action. And so if you have that as your most basic form of, of, of function, the wave is a thing that happens inside the molecules of the body. And that wave starts to happen when you're a bacteria and you are in a soup and you don't have enough food. And the way that you operate is through Brownian motion and you spin your flagella until you get a molecule and your flagella starts to spin in a direction where you continue to travel. But then you dissociate the molecule and then you spin randomly until you find another one. And that way you gradually work your way up the concentration gradient. That's the same process by which experience is managed inside of a human body except for the fact that it's far more complicated what you're still looking at of course is the flagella is the robot right the cell is a robot in the sense it's all just molecules enacting certain kind of mechanisms that are producing a desired behavior in an entirely mechanical way and what most people seem to be confused about is that they don't see how a mechanism can have experience well, it's because the, okay, so I personally think that the cell has experience. Like, I think that a bacteria, when it is about to die, feels that it is about to die. Why? Because I think that it experiences redox stress, and that's electrical, and you can feel electricity. But uh, why is there a self in the bacterium? So the self is something that requires multiple, m like progressively more complex modules that come together that are able to form an, ex an external representation of the environment and then relay that onto their place in it. And so I agree that the self is more complicated than what the bacteria has, but I don't think that you have to have a conception of self to have an experience. That's, that's the fundamental problem. Like the experience predates the self. This is tantamount obvious because animals that don't have a sense of self still have experience and so the um, idea that it, the entire theory rests on the emergence of the self out of out of a like that if you have experience you must have a self to me doesn't totally make sense i think you need to have something like an attentional self to be conscious and a personal self is something that is developed later and is much more specific where you attribute much more to yourself than uh, the fact that you observe. And also, uh, when you're an attentional self, it doesn't mean that you ne necessarily have a language in which you can mm. uh, reason about the fact that you observe yourself and you're able to conceptualize yourself in any way. Right? So you uh, can be an entirely pre-conceptual agent that still is conscious. And the boundary condition of that can probably be seen in dreams. There are basically states in which you do not have a notion of a self beyond the fact that you have some kind of reflexive attention, where you observe yourself observing. And yet, it's not clear to me that the bacterium would necessarily be reflexive in this sense, that it has an attentional self that is singling out features and that, uh, in, in such a way that it's able to act in a model of its own awareness that would make it conscious. And it's not obvious to me that the bacterium would be conscious, but I don't think that without, uh, that without consciousness you can have experience. I think a person that is unconscious doesn't have experience. And Do you mean somebody... self-awareness by consciousness? Is that no. what you mean? No, I mean uh, awareness of awareness. So you can also be not aware of yourself while being conscious, even though typically the awareness of the fact that you're aware is only one step away. But you have awareness of content, awareness of the mode of experience, and reflexive awareness that usually come together in a conscious system. But without uh, this singling out of features that you're attending to, I don't think that you can be conscious. It is, this seems to be one of the necessary conditions for consciousness. And it's not obvious to me that bacteria have to fulfill this condition to function. Well, I think that it's possible that the bacteria don't fulfill 
the conditions of a human. I think that to say that they do would be absurd. Yes, but it's not what we are asking for. We are asking for in order to be a functioning bacterium with a cellular membrane and some metabolism and the ability to self-replicate and uh, to adapt to some degree to environmental circumstances. For all these robotic functions, it's not obvious uh, that uh, the bacterium needs to be more conscious than a soccer playing robot, which is not conscious. Right? If you build a robot that plays soccer, uh, it's uh, the robot is fulfilling a bunch of functions. It's going to model its environment. It's going to figure out where the ball is, where the other robots are, where the goal is, how to get the ball between yourself and the goal, how to push the ball into the goal, and so on. So in some functional sense, it's going to have uh, beliefs about the environment. It's going to have commitments about course of actions. It's going to have goal-directed behavior. It's going to have representations about the world with itself inside, but I don't think it experiences anything. But I think that the reason that it doesn't experience anything is because it isn't sufficiently complex the circuit that's inside the soccer playing robot it's not sufficiently flexible yeah that too do you want to elaborate on that well it seems to me that in order to conceptualize you have to be flexible and imagine something that doesn't already exist and that seems like a difficulty for unconscious entities so the soccer playing robot never decides to play rugby, but the bacteria that's eating ethanol can then shift to eating plastic. I'm not sure if the bacteria in general have this much choice. They do. I mean, like the, the, the metabolic flexibility of most bacteria is stunning. Like, the, they're packaged with the ability to eat a shocking number of substrates. And so there is a choice where if you have an environment that has a bunch of different chemicals in it, you can choose what you eat. The robot, if you, treat, if you teach it to play soccer and you put it in a pen with a bunch of balls, only one of which is a soccer ball, you would have to then program it to pick the soccer ball out and then to play soccer. If you wanted it to be a game-playing robot, you would then have to program it to be able to play whatever game you play with whatever form factor ball, right? You'd have a tennis ball, rugby, high ally, whatever. And so in order to get something that even begins to approximate the kind of flexibility of a bacterium, you have to program something that is far more complex than a soccer-playing robot because to minimize a bacteria to a soccer-playing robot is to erase the magnificent functional complexity that is inside that little package. I think you are putting too much into your language that is uh, basically inducing you to have an, a state that makes you more likely to appreciate magic. Uh, I think if you take a bacterium and you put it into a novel environment the bacterium hasn't experienced before, per default the bacterium is dying. It's basically happening all the time. If you t just pick an arbitrary bacterium from its normal habitat, put it into a completely new environment where it doesn't find the food that it's used to, it dies. The reason why so many bacteria survive is because you, uh, you typically don't just pick one, you pick many, many of that which have a potential to thrive uh, and they might evolve quickly. A single cell evolution is very quickly, but they need to have a starting point where they can already work with this. And many families of bacteria are able to work over a range of environments. But um, I suspect that you can have diff very different degrees of complexity in the bacterium and there are probably bacteria which are really, really stupid and very non-adaptive, and uh, in the same way you can build a soccer-playing robot that is extremely complex. If you think about the complexity of the systems that people are building, the weights of stable diffusion are just two gigabytes, and they're the result of training on a few hundred million images and text. And they contain all the artistic styles and uh, all uh, celebrities and all the dinosaurs and all the plants, and have a very visual universe that is much larger than the visual universe of a person, and it's only two gigabytes. And it's probably far exceeds the ability of a bacterium to recognize environment. But building two gigabytes into the vision system of a soccer playing robot doesn't seem to be really daunting. So the complexity that you can build into the soccer playing robot can be very, very large compared to the complexity of what happens uh, effectively in a human brain, right? Of course, emulating the functionality of a group of neurons can be very expensive. But how many neurons do you need to run macOS? How many brains would you need to run macOS in a stable way? It, Probably it, not that many. I think quite a few. Because new ones are not very deterministic. You would need to create an enormous amount of redundancy to make this happen and to work uh, out. And so it's basically deterministic structure that you want to build into a brain. 
is is not working all that well. You can uh, uh, build a, a vision system with a slow, mushy brain, right? That and still you would not be able to put in such a way that it's able to within one week of training is able to infer the structure of the world from looking at 800 million pictures and captions. This is a task that no biological brain can perform. But the, what's interesting is the biological brain can perform the task with much less training. Yes, which and so suggests that, that there's a better algorithm than the one that we're currently using. Yeah, it's the biological one. It's the it's the structure. It's the it's the connection of the wetware to itself that in that uh, integrates the controller with the executor. And that's kind of my point, where it's like any exercise that attempts to explain consciousness without the physical substrate, without recognizing that the physical substrate is mandatory for the effect that we're seeing and is the iterative product of progressive complexity that has been evolving on Earth for the last four billion years, will fail to produce consciousness because it is inherent in the structural organization of these different modules that resonate with one another to create complexity. Because I was thinking about this earlier when you said about, you know, the bacteria is really simple. I think you're right. Where if you if we go back to this idea of complex harmonics being the 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 phenomenon of experience is is all these different resonant modes. You can think about what it feels like to listen to a sine wave versus what it feels like to listen to a symphony. They're the same thing. Except the sine wave has been modulated into something far more complex, and that complex wave has something else in it. I cannot help but feel that when you are um, describing biology, you are ascribing something to biology that cannot emerge over chemistry. Uh, and I chemistry or chemistry has properties that cannot be explained by physics. And this is not the perspective that I have. For me, everything ultimately gets resolved into state transitions that can be described qualitatively and quantitatively. So there is basically no, at no point does magic enter the system. And uh, the way in which you describe biology, for me, it still has to be uh, reproduced by the mechanisms. So, so I, I cannot make this claim. I don't see how you can make that claim. I, uh, I would say that there are bacteria which are very complex in their behavior. Like a stentor is basically a little animal that is hunting other animals. And yet the behavior of the stentor, which is very complex, is not as complicated as the behavior of a soccer playing robot. The externally observed behavior with, in, with respect to the environment. The mechanisms of the soccer playing robot are much simpler because the soccer playing robot doesn't need to be self organizing because I can make it, right? So there doesn't need to be a second order system that enables the uh, soccer playing robot to harvest its own energy in the environment from basic foodstuffs and uh, to build its own structure and to repair its own structure after it's been disturbed, to self replicate and so on, right? Imagining a self replicating soccer robot. That would be a behavior that no so uh, soccer playing robot can perform. But just the interaction between the environment and playing a ball into a goal is something that I think no bacterium can do. That's an interesting experiment, and I don't know the answer to that. But I immediately think that there is something important in that phenomenon, which I think you dismiss kind of easily, which is the self-regulation and the replication and the evolution which when you look at a simple system like a bacterium, it is a seed for the complexity that comes downstream because you go from bacterium to biofilm. And in the biofilm, you have an awareness of the environment because you are responding to the environment in an organized way. Like there's layers in the biofilm that based off of oxygen uh, penetration will produce different things. Well, Anastasia, I'm not dismissing this. I want to define the self-organization in such a way that I can decide whether it's present in the system. When you talk about awareness, I ask you to give me a formal definition of awareness that I can apply to any given system to see whether it's present or not. You're just postulating it. You cannot just postulate that the biofilm has awareness of its environment. It's possible, in my perspective, that the biofilm produces the observable behavior without having awareness. It can just mechanically react to it. So in something that is like the human, 
if you change, like, let's say you put a, a, a brain scanner on a human. Mm-hmm. And this is what the QRI work is interesting, where it's interesting, because there appear to be different states inside the brain that correspond to emotional states. And so if you are unhappy or you're feeling depressed, there's a different brainwave state that is associated with that experience. And what you can do is you can modulate that brainwave state and induce a different sensation. So transcranial magnetic stimulation. Did you read about that woman who had intractable depression and then they inserted a, an electromagnetic pacemaker into the brain that cured her depression? Uh, there are a number of phenomena like this. And I think if you look at a computer that is producing a glitch, it's also conceivable that you can build some pacemaker into the computer so the computer no longer produces that glitch. Right? It still doesn't explain uh, how the computer is producing the stuff that is not the glitch. Maybe you want to explain why is my computer play, uh, displaying a three-dimensional world, something like Minecraft. Why are there colors in Minecraft? Why is there three-dimensional space in Minecraft? You now I have to come up with a detailed explanation that explains to you how simple circuits, lots of transistors and so on in the computer can be set up in such a way that they produce these phenomena. And not only that, you can also stop this and make the computer produce music instead. Right? That, uh, in a completely different environment. How is that possible? And this is the thing, the kind of phenomenon that we want to explain, also with respect to the mind. We want to explain how is it possible that you are said it's not sufficient to look at some kind of correlate. The correlate itself is not an explanation. To say that uh, in many people who are said this is correlated with uh, these and these brain waves or with this and this EEG pattern, and if I build a machine that is changing them, you can sometimes see a change, not always. That's not sufficient. You want to have a causal explanation. You want to explain. What is actually the phenomenon that you're talking about? What does sadness mean? What is actually sadness? Right? Sadness is an affect that is directed on some uh, source of satisfying a need being permanently removed from your world. You can never get it back. And it's completely crucial to you. You identify it as satisfying yourself through the source of satisfaction. And it's gone. It will never come back. Right? This is sadness in some sense. And a, and a stronger form of sadness is grief. This paralyzing form of sadness. And uh, sadness leads to certain behaviors, mostly a disengagement with the world because you're helpless. You cannot do anything about it. In supplicative behavior, you're appealing to environment to help you with the situation and to create a solution for a problem for which you're incapable of finding one. And uh, so sadness is some complex psychological phenomenon that, that you can formally define. And the question is, how is it implemented in the brain? And what's also crucial about sadness is that you experience yourself changing as a result of sadness. And without this experience, you wouldn't say that somebody is sad. You would say somebody acts as if they are sad. But there's a difference between acting as if you are sad and actually being sad, because that requires an experience of sadness. And so we are coming back to this original question. How is it possible that a system that is mechanically implemented is actually feeling something? And don't say waves that are interacting with each other. That seems, sounds like magical thinking to me because it's not adding anything beyond molecules bumping into each other. And you're saying more, more complexity, it just means more comp- uh, molecules bumping more complexly into each other. It's probably true, right? But it's not explaining it. It seems like the magical transition for me is the ability to conceptualize. And I think that's at the heart of defining intelligence as well. The ability to th- pick out relationships in the world and then pick out relationships between the relationships and then orient your being towards whatever you want within that set of Can confines. Can you define this formally, what it means to conceptualize? Absolutely. So a concept is a relationship, a, a fundamentally a concept is a relationship between two physical bodies. So one is moving towards the other, let's say. And then an abstract concept would be taking that motion and relating it to another concept. And you can compound these into greater and greater degrees of abstraction where you're talking about how to play the stock market or something like that at some point, which is a highly abstract, or how to do quantum physics, which is a highly abstract series of concepts. But this ability to conceptualize seems to be wholly unique to the biological domain. And as in, I've never seen a computer conceptualize anything before. You right. can only the take model is conceptualizing things, or a uh, vision model is also conceptualizing things. It's not difficult to build a system that creates uh, it's a model of relationship between physical objects and makes abstractions over them, puts them into some kind of embedding space. 
uh, and but can it, can, make, can it make a new relationship? Is, I've never seen a computer make a new relationship. It's never come to me and said, hey, these th- this data set that I'm studying, I think there's something happening over here which is interesting and could explain something to us. They, they're not capable of giving that new order of conceptualization. They don't put relationships together and give you a, a new relationship. Beyond the bounds of their programming, is I think what yeah, you're yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. So it means I, you have never tried ChatGPT. No, I, no, I have, but ChatGPT has never, ever come up with its own idea for me. It just takes my idea, my conceptualization, and elaborates, embellishes, gives me aid with it. Same with Midjourney. It's not going to solve my problem for me. I have to conceptualize how to trick Midjourney into making the image that I have in my mind. But I had it in my mind to begin with, and I've never seen a computer have something in its mind to begin with. Like, I think that a great illustration of this point is if you go to Midjourney and you're like, make me a YouTube thumbnail for a video about this, it can't really do it. And maybe you can say that given enough time and enough training data that it would understand a YouTube thumbnail well enough to be able to approximate something that is the right amount of tasty that will perform well on YouTube. But it's not quite there yet. And I think that when it does get there, the only thing that it would be able to do is it would be able to make a YouTube thumbnail that maximized the performance of something that had already been done, but it's unlikely that it would create a new genre of YouTube thumbnail. Because there's genres for these things, right? Like there's there's ideas that people have where it's like, okay, you have to have a face that's looking a certain way, and then you have to have some splashy text that looks this way, and this is a format that works and people use it, but somebody invented that format at some point. And so does the machine invent the format or can it only take the existing format and just kind of roughly map your instructions onto something that it has been as a successful YouTube thumbnail and give you that? Yeah, it's, it's our ability to instruct ourselves, which is wholly unique. And I don't see any hint of that in the artificial. I think the word intelligence is completely inappropriate to describe these machines because they don't have that ability to de novo generate concepts. I, uh, can you create a concept in Novo, please? Absolutely, yeah. But go ahead, tell me something I haven't heard yet. I mean, every time that I write a piece of music, I'm I'm stitching together all sorts of new concepts. I'm going to use this synthesizer in a way I've never used it before to accomplish some goal that I couldn't have imagined before I set this harmonic progression in front of myself. Oh, I have the same impression when I use uh, Image Generator. After Dali came out, I got Access, uh, and I spent uh, several days producing hundreds of illustrations for the book of imaginary beings by Bach. And I found that uh, it had profound difficulties when it came to chimeras, which means it takes a long time, many tr- attempts to get a working chimera. And that has to do with the particular kind of mechanism it uses for uh, producing images. So when you are producing um, something like a minotaur or uh, no, a centaur is a better example even, the issue with the centaur, it should have seen a bunch of centaurs. And sometimes it gets a centaur right, like every once in 500 attempts, you get a working centaur. But mostly it produces uh, parts of horses and humans <laughs> early on, and then converges of human and horse in some <laughs> configuration. Exactly. Uh, because uh, it doesn't really know how to grow humans and horses together in most of its default training sets. So it's very hard for it to end up in this local optimum where you end up as the centaur. But it has to do with the particular kind of annealing process that is being used, and there are probably better alternatives to this, or you can overcome this with better training, or with some uh, iterative process that produces it, that you can also build into the model. There are other issues that it had. The Dali version that I've been working with was very bad at counting. So if you want to make a, a dragon with nine heads, it is really very difficult to get something that comes close. Uh, it works, it is able to count until two plus minus one or sometimes three, but then it gets very difficult. And these models have gotten better, right? Like, uh, when you now generate pictures with mid-journey, very often the number of fingers is correct. Hands are still somewhat <laughs> difficult. I'm really glad they fixed that. A joke when some uh, bot is talking to me or in my Twitter DMs or on WhatsApp, I ask them to send a picture not of their uh, pretty Japanese face, but of their hands. 
And they typically don't. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, right, it's, it's uh, in some sense very wild what uh, is happening, but there were new genres that emerging after Mid Journey came out, like the genre of Kermit the Frog in uh, Space Odyssey and other movies. That was for a short time a small genre that popped up. And now you have uh, the uh, Balenciaga genre uh, on YouTube. Uh, and the um, everything as well as Anderson movie genre on YouTube, and of course it gets old fast. But uh, there is something deeper going on with generative AI due to the temporal instability. This all the stuff has not been trained on video so far, uh, none of the released models, but uh, on individual frames. And as a result, it's hard to make them temporarily stable. Which means that if you try to create a movie, they often flicker, and every frame is slightly different from a slightly different movie is still right and this creates something new it creates a new form of art in which you realize the ephemerality of the form and what's stable is the concept that is referred to by the prompt right we now have an art where the concept itself becomes visible behind the form because the form is flickering and changing in every frame that's quite fascinating it didn't exist before it and if you wanted to produce it, it was very difficult and expensive to make and now it falls out for free so there is a new type of art that is possible i also noticed very simple things when you asked dali to produce an ultrasound of a dragon egg that was not in its training data and it makes a pretty good job right and some there's something that does uh, require a certain degree of creativity in humans to put all these latent dimensions together why does this work i think it works because if you have enough dimensions and you, if you cover the space of these latent dimensions of meaning, extrapolation and interpolation are the same thing. Which means that when we represent meaning, uh, the entire space of meanings can be understood as a high dimensional space in which every dimension is a feature dimension. And every uh, point on this dimension is a state that the feature can be in. And an object is a range in which configurations of features are compatible to produce that object. Right? So you basically get a space of function. Every speech, uh, feature is a function that is uh, varying parameters. And, um, or you could say that a function is a configuration of multiple dimensions if it has uh, multiple parameters that changes that function. And you can create an entire world from this. You could also think about it in a slightly different way when you are creating art with Blender. Blender is a 3D program that allows you to make dynamic scenes and arbitrary objects. And, and some, to some degree of approximation, almost everything that you can visually imagine, you can recreate with Blender. And you do this by creating a hierarchical function that starts with the scene, that is the, the configuration of object that you're looking at. And then you have objects within the scene and uh, overall filters that act on the whole scene and produce certain visual effects. And some of these objects are going to be light sources that can be directed or undirected and have certain features that are discerning the properties of different light sources and define the functional properties. And then you have dynamic objects that are characterized by skeleton along which movement happens and joints in these skeletons and skins that are moving along these uh, joints and on the surface of these skeletons with certain properties. Uh, volumes that can be defined in arbitrary ways with mathematical functions and so on. And then textures that uh, are superimposed on these objects, colors that emerge as parts of these textures in interaction with the light sources and reflective properties of the environment and so on. And so you basically create a complex hierarchical function that is producing all these visual effects. Your mind is probably doing the same. Right? When you are perceiving things, your mind is has some kind of game engine that is trained to track perceptual features in your environment. And the present AI systems are doing a relatively good job at doing a similar thing. Arguably, they're not doing this via self-organization, but via some kind of brute force. But the causal structure of the models that are being generated is pretty similar. And uh, I would lie if I would say that it's not surprising what DALI or Midjourney are generating. Very often, they're not generating what I have in mind. But this is also, would also be true if I was an art director and talk to a minion to produce something for me, right? There are probably many iterations until that gets close to what I have in mind. And with mid-journey, the process is not that different. And right? so mid-journey in some sense works like an extremely fast, highly skilled, very autistic artist that has seen a lot and is able to combine stuff across many dimensions to produce things that it has never seen and nobody has ever seen. I would say that it 
lacks understanding, though. It doesn't have the self-organizing. I think that's the hinge. It doesn't have the generative ability to pr- prompt engineer itself. So that that is, I think, one prong of this. And the other prong of this is the fact that the things that it generates have no meaning for it. Mm. And when you're trying to deal with the question of consciousness and you're like, what is the experience of seeing red? You have to assume that there is a function of red in the evolutionary past that played a role that encodes the way that you perceive it, that is the echo of the simpler mind that perceived red for the first time, and is the progenitor of what will come after. I suspect that red by itself doesn't look like anything, in the same way as when you are only looking at the blue sky, you don't see the blueness after a while. Red is a property that is shared by uh, the surfaces of red objects. Right? And it's distinct from the surfaces of blue objects. And uh, the thing that makes it distinct is the relationship that it has to certain objects. Right? It's the color of blood, the color of roses, and so on. It's the thing that they have in common. And uh, that's why I also don't think that the inverted spectrum illusion would work, because I don't think that there is any essence of red beyond its relational context of being a surface property of visual objects that share this property across uh, lighting circumstances. So it's basically an invariance in the world, in the space of uh, similar invariances that exist in the same function space. And if you transmit this to your model of uh, of Blender, right, there is redness is basically some kind of stationary property of a s- surface. It cannot be rotated into other colors. In this way, you have a color space that does not really allow you to do the same rotations as you have in a spatial space, where you can take an object and uh, rotate it around an angle, and it's still somehow the same object. This does not really work with colors. But you can also have a color space in which you have multiple colors which you shift because you change the lighting and thereby perform something similar. Right? So there are certain properties, and they're all mathematical properties. And it turns out that basically color is a polar coordinate representation in your brain with respect uh, to certain relational properties. And that's why you can also have synesthesia about color, because you can use the same mathematical construct to represent aspects of sound or numbers. And if you do this, you can experience them as colors in your mind. Right? So functionally, colors are a particular kind of mathematical object. And uh, that still doesn't explain why you experience them. And but I you've think experienced most- them all along the line, right? Like if you are the end result of 3.8 billion years of evolution, you've probably seen red before. You've probably experienced them because they're useful, right? Humans have an extraordinary capacity to distinguish colors compared to other animals. But this does not explain uh, how it technically works, right? The fact that something is useful does not explain uh, how it's actually possible. The fact that it's useful for uh, birds to fly does not by itself explain how it's possible for birds to fly. Well, there's a neuromechanical explanation for the perception of color, right? I mean, you have photoreceptors in your eyes that transduce different energies depending on the stimulation they receive, and there's a way of integrating all of that signal in the visual cortex and so on and so forth. Yeah, and... but you only understand it if you can rebuild it. So, for instance, what I noticed when we built soccer playing robots and we characterized colors as wavelengths, it didn't really work. Because... Uh, there, for instance, there's reflection of the orange ball in the green field, and we use very intense primary colors to make the task of color segmentation as easy as possible under very even controlled lighting. Right? And uh, it didn't really work even under very, uh, even controlled lighting because color is not really a wavelength. It's something that is relative to the, to the objects. We found that uh, the uh, green field below the ball is more orange then uh, the orange ball above the green field due to the mutual reflection is uh, not green. And in order to interpret them properly, we would have to become much more lenient and uh, accommodate the fact that these reflections are happening. And so in some sense, orange is what a ball can get away with being when it's an orange ball under the circumstances that it's in its environment, which are variances in lighting and green objects nearby and so on. Well, I think that that's, that actually strikes at the heart of something really important, which is that the, the human perceptual framework, the consciousness, is able to differentiate between useful information and not useful information. And that's something that you get in when you're using these mid-journey prompts, where 
it it has a really hard time. You can give it weights and you can kind of you can you can control how it gives importance to various things, but it's really hard to to tune meaning into it. Like when you're talking about the fact that it doesn't know how to make a centaur, it's because it doesn't understand anatomy and it doesn't understand what an animal body is and what a human body is. I was really struck by its inability to make hands because to me it was a reflection of the fact that it was a machine that didn't understand what it would be like to pick something up and the biomechanics of what of what hands do. But you know, humans are also horrible at drawing hands. Like I know a number of artists who really struggle <laughs> doing hands. Hands are extremely difficult. So it's not a big surprise that the AI struggles with doing hands. And I would say that the AI is bad at anatomy. The uh, Midjourney is definitely much better at anatomy than the average human being. I think that it is decent at anatomy that is conventional. So it's if you are trying to make something that is a human, there's enough pictures of humans in its t in its training data set that it can say, okay, this is the shape of a human. I can move that shape because I've seen it in enough different shapes. But if you ask it for a really weird perspective or you ask it for something that isn't really represented in its training set, it doesn't have a conceptual model of human that it can then put into that really weird foreshortening or into the really weird contorted position. Yeah. That's when you start That's to get monsters. Marcus told me about Delhi, then I uh, created people from all sorts of perspectives and unicorns from all sorts of perspectives. It's not an issue. It's not true. It does okay. understand the three-dimensional structure of objects and is usually able to represent them better than, than most people do. I think it does understand the structure of three-dimensional space due to its training data. And that's why you can also take these models and tune them to produce three-dimensional objects as an output. This is a conversation that I feel like would be best had with a portal with mid-journey in it, where we could like try different prompts yeah. as we do it. I think that but would be really I, I also don't think that's actually the problem that we are having. Because the interesting thing is I I don't believe that mid-journey is experiencing any of that. Right? I would agree. And so I would the, agree. the interesting question is what is missing to make this experience something? And the uh, fact that I, it's coming from somewhere and going somewhere. Nah. I, I, I don't just I don't know answer. how you I don't know how you can dismiss that like that is what life is and consciousness I, okay do we agree all three of us sitting here that consciousness is a property of life no 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 what else is conscious it's uh, the ability of a system to uh, experience itself observing it's basically an awareness of your own awareness. What else can do that except for life? Uh, at the moment, it's only some living systems that can do it. Okay. Possibly, but we don't know this, some AI systems. What is the evidence for AI systems being able to do it? That they're able to report about the features of it. After they've been trained on literature that contains stories about AI futures? That is one of the problems, right? So we uh, have difficulty to discern to which degree the AI system is able to do something because it has seen this in the text. And it, it, on the other hand, it's hard to say how that is different from the causal structure that is being implemented. If you think, for instance, reasoning, can an AI system reason? It's somewhat related to the question, can a person reason? Can a human being reason? Right? We have an intuition about how reasoning works. And this intuition is, is not completely nonsensical, but it's also not perfect. And Aristotle tries to systematize it and really writes it all down, and he gets only 80% correct. And then he tries to systematize over syllogisms and how to do reasoning properly. And then later on, there are people like Tarski and uh, Frege and so on who really reason about reasoning and come up with a formal theory of reasoning that is way better. And the people that are reasoning professionally today for a living, they basically read stuff that is derived from this. It's not derived by them just sitting uh, there and thinking about how their own reasoning works and figuring it out magically, right? So in some sense, people to some degree are language models that build causal structure influenced by texts that they read and trying to map this causal structure onto other texts that they've read until it clicks. I would, I would agree with that it's because I always think about the you know Romanian orphanage example where if you have children that are completely abandoned by the society they don't grow up n normal the, mm -hmm. the, there's something about the system that needs both touch and and emotional connection and intellectual stimulation in order to form what we define as being 
you know, a, a person that fits into society. I still think that they're probably conscious. They're just not uh, able to make the same sort of cognitive leaps and and yeah. developments. I'm also convinced made. that cats are conscious. And it's something I, that you can, in some sense, verify by going into some kind of feedback loop with the cat. So you basically have a mutual awareness of the awareness of the other. So then doesn't that obviate the example of the philosophical zombie? Because you can just go into a, a loop with the zombie to to confirm the fact that they are having experience, even if you can't cut them open to see that they have a brain yes. or put a machine on them. So uh, this is points to a very interesting aspect of the discussion about the hard problem. It's ex uh, essentialism versus functionalism. Essentialism is the position that something is just intrinsically in a particular way without realizing some kind of function. And so uh, a lot of philosophers who feel that consciousness can not be explained as the result of some kind of causal interaction of non-conscious physical phenomena, uh, they suspect that consciousness needs to made, be made fundamental. And if consciousness is a fundamental property of matter, then you end up with a version of panpsychism. Mm. And the drawback of panpsychism is, of course, that it does not explain how consciousness comes about. Mm -hmm. Because it's an answer of the fact that you cannot explain it and thereby say it's irreducible. It's just an essential property of something. Mm -hmm. And when you say that consciousness is a property of biology, it sounds a little bit like this to me. I'm not sure if this is what you mean, but it could be that you are stating that it's an essential property that is just emerging in biological system of, of, as a result of them by being biological systems. Okay, so in order to be... A, a cell that survives, you have to have a way of integrating information about your environment relative to your internal state in such a way that you can bring the two into alignment. And so you can call it a thermostat, but I think that that's probably a dismissive way of treating it because it's like the world's most complicated thermostat. And you're right that if you put it into the wrong conditions, it will die. But it's also a thermostat that if the conditions change slowly enough, it will adapt to the new conditions. And so it will become not a thermostat purely, it will become a thermostat and something else. And a thermostat can't do that. And so there is a structural, mechanical event that happens in the bacteria that is the absolute simplest form of what we ascribe as being consciousness. Like, our consciousness is not the consciousness of bacteria. And I don't think that rocks are conscious. I don't think that atoms are conscious. But I do think that by the time that you get to a cell, there is this goal-directedness where there is a future that, of, that you are working towards. And that simplest future for bacteria is, I want to survive. And it's not written out in natural language of, I want to survive. It's programmed to survive and then to turn into something that will survive when the situation changes. And when you have a long enough chain of those situations changing, you have organisms that emerge that are able to specialize to different conditions. And as you change your organization and make it more complex so that you're able to look at stuff from more perspectives at once, you start to build progressively more complicated systems. And those more complicated systems have more complex consciousness. And at some point, you get to the realization that, oh, hold on a second, there's me and I am a stable self and I can change who I am. And that's a, that's a crazy step. But I don't think that it's a step that's magical. I think that it's a step that is the result of progressively more and more complex modules that are able to perform the computational task of holding all of these concepts in a stable state relative to one another for long enough for you to be able to look at them and consider them. And then, after you've considered them, to decide what you want to do next. Like, the bacteria might not be able to change itself, but it might be able to move a piece of dirt out of the way to get somewhere that it wants to do. It's not to get to. That might something that the soccer playing robot can also do. That I don't want to ascribe consciousness to without being forced to. Right? Uh, and I feel that you are much more reluctant to ascribe consciousness to the soccer playing robot than you are to the cell, despite the cell probably being dumber than it's, uh, it's the, the evolution. Playing robot. Oops, it's the it's the evolution that's important. It's the I, fact that I it came from. I don't see how the process that generates a certain thing 
is uh, defining its functional properties qualitatively. And right? if you are evolving the soccer playing robot and it's the same soccer playing robot, it doesn't change anything. It, re uh, it only matters what it is embodying at this time when I look at it. I, but I don't think that is, I think that that's not how I see consciousness because I see consciousness as something that is across time. I think yeah, that it could also be that uh, your uh, issue with the communication about the hard problem is that you have a non standard definition of consciousness that is uh, meaning something completely different. For most people that talk about consciousness, it's about the feeling of what it's like. And uh, this feeling of what it's like, there are some philosophers which believe that it comes in degrees. There are certain ways in which you can have a feeling of what it's like. They're, they're, they're qualitatively different from each other, and maybe there are some degrees. But um, you could also say that uh, there's a continuous way in which you can become more or less conscious. But I don't think that, uh, um, I'm not in the camp that thinks that this is the right interpretation. I think that consciousness is qualitative. I think that there is basically a disruption between conscious and not conscious and there is some area in between where it becomes online and very only approximately conscious but there are no systems that are persistently in a state of only being approximately vaguely conscious it's just only during this transition that there is some kind of coherence formation that happens between sleeping and waking or uh, waking up into a dream within sleep or out of a dream Right, this uh, this movement inside of a conscious state or outside of a conscious state is a qualitative difference. And, uh, and the uh, criterion between them is that outside of a conscious state, there is no feeling of what it's like. So if you, you fall unconscious because maybe you faint, right? In this state, you don't know what it's like to have fainted. You wake up and you don't realize what happened. You have no memory trace of that state. And... Uh, there's probably nothing that your brain, uh, that your mind went to in the meantime and was conscious about something else and just uh, did not bring the memory along. You were just not conscious for all practical uh, means and purposes. So I think that consciousness is a qualitative property that is, is not like fatness, right? You could say that fatness is something that's very gradual. And you could also say that bacteria are, can sometimes be fat, but if they're fat, they're fat in a very different way than humans are. Right? In this sense, it makes sense, but I don't think that consciousness is like fatness. I don't think that bacteria are conscious. It's, it's possible and conceivable that they are, but it would require that they have a very particular functional mechanism that would enable the bacterium to feel what it's like. And if the bacterium doesn't have that, I would say it's not conscious. It's just the way I would, in which I would use the word. Can we agree on this usage of the word? I think that the fundamental difference between the robot and the this real soccer player is that the real soccer player could decide to just quit and do MMA instead. Like you can build a robot like that. That's not the big problem. That decides to take on a completely different task. Yeah, sure. But by its own, it just yeah. decides that. Yes. Uh, can you, you it, can you explain uh, that? You me? give it a larger reward function. So you give it some kind of polythematic reward function, a similar way as we do. But and you have play, to do that. Yeah, but we can give it this, right? You are born with this reward function to a large degree. Some part of it's come online during uh, later stages in your life. But for the most part, your reward function is built into you by your organism, right? So your mind is subject to some functions that are imposed on it by the organism. And your personal self is subject to the expression of these motivational urges by your outside mind that makes you do stuff. And the way this is uh, functionally implemented or the way in which you can abstract it is that there is some kind of multidimensional reward function that tells you in a given situation, in a given context, this is the value of a kiss, this is the value of a sandwich, this is the value of getting the ball and the goal. And if that changes, you might give up the plan on getting the ball into the goal and choose a completely different game to play because you feel that this other game is giving you better rewards which does require you to be able to have a meta game that you are playing. And so if you have a soccer playing robot that only is playing the single game and cannot conceptualize anything outside of it, then of course it will not be able to make that decision. But if the robot is thinking of itself as an agent that can play soccer or um, uh, look for a sandwich or look for a kiss, uh, as, uh, as you might, right? then uh, you have a much larger area in which you're going to optimize your expected rewards. But it's not a soccer playing robot anymore. It's a human being, essentially. Like you've just re you've just rebuilt life at that point. Uh, but we are not necessarily at consciousness yet. 
So what I described, this functionality is still a robot that is just playing a different game. But we have not arrived yet at the system, despite producing all sorts of functionality that you would only expect a human to be capable of. And you can even conceive of a system that is able to produce coherent sentences and interact with you in all sorts of ways without being conscious. So there is this big question for a lot of people. What is the difference between this universal robot that is uh, pursuing the same goals as a human being and it has the same degrees of flexibility of, as a human being in pursuing them? and can make decisions over them in a functional way in the, in the sense that it commits to different goals at different times based on reasons that are built into neural networks and reasoning mechanisms. And it's able to report and self-report all ab about all these things. And yet there's nothing what it's like to be that robot. Right, this is the hard problem. What What is that difference? What if it has the ability to integrate all of these, ex all of these motivations isn't that what experience is ultimately? No. Yeah, like why are you so sure that it's not conscious at that point? Because I, th I think there is no reason for that system to say, but I feel this. But isn't the desire to, isn't that decision to go and do MMA instead of soccer predicated on feelings? No, you could simply say there is a, a, a 0 0.2 higher utility in uh, making a sandwich uh, rather than continue to play soccer so i'm going to do that but it might not be higher utility it might actually be a terrible idea to go and do mma if you're the best soccer player in the world but you just want to do it because you love mma oh that's a great point humans don't perform along these sorts of utility functions somebody can do something that doesn't maximize utility they do it all the time i think that is a complicated philosophical decision because because uh, it's there is usually a reason that you find something more meaningful and important to do something when you do it. Or it's a compulsion, which means you realize uh, you have a long game, but you are unable to play it because the mechanism in your brain is overriding it and you're forced to follow an impulse to play a shorter game. But when you find something meaningful, it means that you can also describe it or somebody could describe it with a utility function. So for instance, if your meaning is to serve God, it means that you are... Uh, projecting some higher level agent that you're part of in a similar way as a cell as part of an organism and you're serving that transcendental agency and that creates meaning that is more important than your individual existence because you don't conceptualize yourself as the top uh, root node of the universe but just as a cell that is serving some larger organism right and you can try to figure out the relevance of that uh, with, with respect to getting a sandwich instead well, and, so then uh, I think suddenly getting the centers is instrumental to serving this higher meaning to some degree. I, I think that we've kind of stumbled onto something important here, which is that the complexity of the utility function and the ability to have multiple competing short term and long term goals and this freedom of space in which to decide the way in which you will chain those actions together in order to achieve a goal that you have decided is utilitarian is the thing that you would then probably call consciousness. And so the reason that the robot isn't conscious is because the robot has such a narrow scope of options available to it that it's too simple. No. But the minute that you create... No, it is, consciousness is the feeling of what it's like. This is what you need to produce. So but the what is the feeling? increasing complexity is not producing a feeling. But hold on. So if you're saying that everything that a human does can be reduced to a utility function... Mm -hmm if you have a sufficiently complex understanding of their internal landscape, mm -hmm. then what feelings are is they are the experience of the utility function. The utility function causes some kind of chemical change inside of you that can be modulated either with neurotransmitters, it can be modulated with the potassium-sodium balance at the membranes, it can be modulated by the uh, harmonics of your brain waves, and when you're doing that thing, you have this full-body electrochemical state that is the experience it is it is the it, it the experience lives inside of the body and so your feeling of a decision that you make is the result of everything that happens inside of your body as you are making the decision that's what feeling is it's the sum total of the whole electrochemical state of the entire body as it does something with respect to the rest of the universe <laughs> I would, yeah. It's very poetic, but uh, it's not convincing to me <laughs> because it's uh, still just clockwork. 
and would not explain why there is an agent that experiences itself experiencing something. Well, because the agent has to be the agent has to be able to say, "I'm experiencing this, and this is good, and I will keep experiencing it." Because the agent's job is to make sure that the internal state is such that it can reproduce. That's the agent's job. The agent's job is that life is a state of matter that aims towards complexity, and your job as the agent is to make sure that this crystalline structure of life survives for long enough to make more of itself. And if you fuck that up by feeling bad all the time, you're not going to make that goal. And if you don't make that goal, you have failed at your mission. And so the feeling is the agent who's responsible for enacting the goal checking in to be like, "Hey, are we on the right track?" I don't buy the idea that your uncertainty about whether you're going to reproduce is reflecting uh, uncertainty about whether you're conscious or not. Uh, hold on, say it again. <laughs> you just uh, connected it to reproduction. And uh, at the beginning of our conversation, you did mention uncertainty about whether you intend to reproduce. That does not reflect uncertainty about your consciousness, right? Your consciousness is completely uncorrelated to this. No, but but I, your feelings are correlated. To but it. my feelings are some of them. To it. Some of I'll them are, but not the ability to feel it itself. The ability to feel itself has to be the result of some causal process that a lot of people find confusing to get at because. It is not apparent how a physical system would feel. It, it, it seems to me that feeling is a property that you can only dream. And what we have to explain is how a physical system is able to produce dreams. I think that the question of how a physical system can produce dreams is a really interesting question, but it might be a good place for us to pause because we've been going... I also think that it's worth... It's interesting that if we can't explain how humans are able to produce feelings, then we can't rule out the fact that bacteria produce feelings as well. And But this is not the point. I think we can explain how humans produce feelings by coming up with an explanation that would produce a causal agent that is reporting feelings. But, uh, the fact that bacteria do not report feelings is uh, a possible indication that they don't have any. The fact that people uh, report feelings produces this burden of explanation of this phenomenon. Uh, to simply say that both people and bacteria are alive and therefore both have feelings is somewhat unsatisfactory. It's, uh, I don't think that bacteria have the same feelings as humans. Like, I want to, I, I, I just... I, mean, exactly. I think it's just really healthy to leave it in the hypothetical realm. You said something earlier where you just were like, well, it's possible or something like that. And I think that's often the best place we can get with our theoretical understanding of nature I'm is not, whether something is I'm possible. I'm happy with this kind of trying to do philosophy. I, I have a suspicion that uh, what is going on is some distinction about the kind of nature of the universe that we are in. When I was a kid, I read both uh, books about physics and our normal post-enlightenment uh, modernist way of understanding our own place in the universe. And I read Blavatsky and um, uh, the, the, uh, Veda and other books. And I realized that there seem to be two fundamental dif fundamentally different conceptions about the nature of the reality that we find ourselves being thrown in. And one is that we are basically in a machine. And we are part of the machine, and there is nothing that is not part of the machine. And this is basically the physicalist idea, that there is a costly closed lowest layer that is entirely mechanical, over which everything else emerges, without any magic ever happening. And in this world, it's pretty hard to explain miracles. And the existence our, of our consciousness seems to be somewhat close to a miracle, right? And if we would uh, perceive magical stuff, like if you're able to uh, burn a black cat and as a result we perceive a new kind of a celestial event, that would, this kind of symbolic interaction would also what classifies as a miracle because it cannot easily be explained by some uh, causal uh, interaction on them, some causally closed lowest layer that doesn't care about symbols, right? And the other explanation that we could be in, that the one that is Im implied by Castaneda's worldview, and so on, is that we are living in a dream, that magic is possible, and that uh, the reason why miracles are so rare is the result of the way in which we are dreaming the dream. Right. So all the causal structure that seems to be so regular, the regularity of physics and so on in this worldview, is explained by features in which the dream is happening. 
And later on, as I tried to think about these worldviews and make a uh, distinction about them, I did notice that I, indeed I am living clearly in a dream. I, it, there's lots of evidence that I'm living in a dream because the features of my dream are malleable. I can, it's very much like a lucid dream at night. I can change the way that a face looks like to me. I can change my memories over the past. I can change my identity. I can change aspects of my consciousness in a pretty fundamental sense. So I am clearly living in the dream. But the regularity in the dream can be explained by there being a parent universe in which there is some kind of machinery that is producing the dream. And the machinery that is producing the dream is the, the brain of a primate in a physical universe. And in this way, I can fit it all together. And I can explain consciousness as a dream property that cannot be explained physically. Like neurons cannot experience anything. Consciousness only is, exists as if. Neurons can do stuff as if, like they can produce representations that only exist as if. In the same way as the stuff in the computer game is only as if, right? It's virtual. It's only existing as a projection. And I think that consciousness is a projection. It's a representational property of a system that is aware of the fact that it's aware. And this is a crucial thing about it that has to do with this hard problem. And it is not readily apparent when you think what you see is physics and the physical universe. And it could be that you don't perceive this as so much as a problem because you have committed yourself relatively early to the insight that you're living in some kind of dream. And in this dream, you can dream about vibrations that produce phenomena in biological systems and that are intrinsically related to consciousness, right? You experience yourself in this dream. You experience that everything is consciousness in the world. Everything that you touch is representational. And I, I think that's true, because we actually are living in that dream. And physics is really talking about another universe that we can never touch. That is, can only be described as mathematics. And my task is to explain stuff in this outside reality that we can never touch, that we can never be in, using mathematical languages. I think that you have struck at the heart of our disagreement then, because I, yes. I do think that there is a very different perspective that we're coming at. Do you want to elaborate? No, go ahead. I mean, you're just saying, I don't think we agree about what physics is fundamentally. Yeah. But, I right. think that uh, Shiloh has expressed that after uh, several hours, like we started a uh, meeting at 11, now it's a quarter to four he is getting a little bit exhausted, which I think is very human and understandable. I think that... Am I? I mean, maybe. It, it is hard to sit in a chair for three or four hours, but no, I just think that fundamentally we're approaching physics as a material science, not as a mathematical science, which starts with bodies interacting with one another. And you can treat this landscape of bodies interacting as a territory, and you can make mathematical maps for it. But That's ultimately... A body is a surface-bound volume that has inward extension. But you, so, you know that physics, uh, the surface-bound volumes are emergent over stuff that is more simple. And ultimately, physics is about information that you can conceptualize as existing in different locations and moving well, so biology. on certain trajectories. Yes, yes, but biology is science. a subset of physics. It's a subset of physics that describes the dynamics of cells, which are uh, complicated arrangements of uh, molecular machinery. They exist many levels above the uh, causally close lowest level of physics. They exist at certain levels of coarse graining, where you already are uh, assuming that particles exist and particles form molecules in some way, and the molecules are forming cellular machinery. But I would never assume that particles exist, right? I mean, a particle is just an instantiation of some measurement or predicted measurement. It's a dynamic factor. A particle is not a static body that has an architecture to it, right? Only, only, only bodies that have locations can exist. There, you can imagine all sorts of bodies like your senator that doesn't exist. It has no location you don't in the universe. In a, a universe that actually has uh, localization in space, localization is something that emerges to some degree of approximation. In our well, universe. localization is just your distance to the other object. Universe. It's yeah. just the distance to all. Sometimes there is no distance. Well, distance. Sometimes there is no distance. What do you mean if two ob if two bodies are touching one another? Uh, if you basically zoom in very hard, what you notice is, is that you only have a quantum universe. Well, that's and a mathematical description. Field. Once again, that's not actually what exactly, physically exactly. manifests. Exactly, it's the lowest level of physics. No, it's the lowest level at which we've been able to conceptualize it 
is that we're using mathematics to describe it. That doesn't mean that because I can mathematically describe the table that it's made out of math. It's just that the table can be described by math. Yes, the atoms this, have architecture, yeah. which allows them to do all of their incredible properties, right? Their architecture yes. fundamentally is what allows them to do light and gravity. And we don't have a man, we don't have a good model in the mainstream for how those atoms' architectures provide for those mysterious phenomena. We just describe them with math and move on because it allows us to build technology. You don't so need you, to understand you, 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 how... Your tables are real, but uh, quantum effects are not real. I, I didn't because say real. Just I, just, I just said that there's... I said it's really, really important to frame the definition of existence in physics, where physics starts with bodies that exist. They have to exist. They have to have that architecture, and it has to have a location with respect to the other bodies in the presentation. No, no, Everything not, else no, is... That's not quite true. No, I think that there are levels of, in foundational physics where you don't have bodies which are surface-constrained volumes, and uh, not everything has a location. This is a it's mistake, though. This is a mistake because then you're talking about unicorns and things that don't exist. No, even though you can conceptualize no. them, they don't necessarily no, you're pertain talking to the about physical world. That is more basic than, than your bodies. You're talking about something that gives rise to bodies that is more fundamental than bodies. But bodies are fundamental to physics. Is my point. Yeah, you can't do I, physics. You're not my talking point about is that your physics. Point is wrong. <laughs> well, well, how would you go ahead? Then how do you define physics? Basically, I guess go to a foundational physics conference. They're not talking about bodies there. That's a problem. That's a really big problem. They were before 150 years ago. They were absolutely only talking progress about bodies. Progress is a bitch. I understand. It's not necessarily progress, right? It's actually getting us down all of these rabbit holes where we have completely untestable theories that aren't necessarily providing for technology, like string theory, for instance. Or, you know, our, like, doomsday cosmology, right? Which is predicated on non-physical situations that emerge from the mathematics but don't have any empirical evidence on Earth whatsoever. Okay, I, I sense that we basically arrived at a point where we will not be able in the next few minutes to uh, achieve <laughs> consensus. And I think that's fine. Um, let's leave it at that for today. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Shiloh. I, and uh, thank you, Anastasia. I really enjoyed our conversation today. And thank you for inviting me on your podcast. I enjoy being with you. I enjoy the perspective that you bring to this and uh, the overall intention that you have behind your exploration. The feeling is mutual. Thank you so much for taking the time and for, for the ideas and the, the many, many questions that we will continue exploring after this conversation. It's been stimulating. Thank you. Thank you, Yosha. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a great rest of your day.